Welcome to this virtual hearing for the inquiry into the coronial jurisdiction in New South Wales. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation who are the traditional custodians of the land on which Parliament sits and where I am today. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to all Aboriginal persons present. Today's hearing is the committee's first public hearing and is being conducted virtually. This enables the work of the committee to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. As we break new ground with the technology, I ask for everyone's patience through any technical difficulties we may experience or encounter today. If participants lose their internet connection or are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they are asked to rejoin the hearing by using the same link provided by the uh, committee secretariat. Today we'll hear from a number of stakeholders and witnesses, including previous state coroners and deputy state coroner and legal experts and researchers uh, in the field of the coronial jurisdiction. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about procedures for today's hearing. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the virtual hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments they may make to the media or to others after they complete their evidence. Uh, committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days of receipt of the transcript. Uh, today's proceedings are being streamed live and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. Finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise disruptions and assist our Hansard reporters. Can I ask committee members to clearly identify to whom questions are directed and could I ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking? Could everyone please mute their microphones when not speaking? Uh, please remember to turn your microphones back on when you're getting ready to speak. Uh, if you start speaking whilst muted, please start your question or answer again so it can be recorded uh, in the Hansard transcript. Uh, members, members and witnesses should avoid speaking over each other so we can all be heard and recorded clearly. I remind members and witnesses to speak directly into the microphone and avoid making comments when your head is turned away. I now welcome our first panel witnesses. Uh, could each witness, starting with Ms Jerram, please state their name, the capacity in which they give evidence today and swear either an oath or an affirmation from the uh, pro forma words that have been emailed to you by the Secretariat. Mary Jerram, former State Coroner of New South Wales from 2007 until 2013. Uh, I, Mary Stella Jerram, do solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence I'm about to give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you. Uh, Associate Professor Dillon. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm playing around with my microphone. Uh, yes, my name is Hugh Dillon. Um, I was a Deputy State Coroner of New South Wales between 2008 and 2016. I'm now a part-time academic and researcher at the University of New South Wales uh, and in the coronial field. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Uh, Mr Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my full name is Michael Allen Barnes. I was the State Coroner in Queensland 2003 to 2013, State Coroner in New South Wales 2014 to 2017. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now given, now about to be given by me shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, would uh, any of you like to make a short 
emphasis on short opening statement, given I know you've all provided uh, very useful and comprehensive written submissions. Uh, Associate Professor Dillon, yours is very comprehensive, but nevertheless, uh, each of you are welcome to make an opening statement should you wish, or we could just proceed to questioning. Ms. Jerram, did you wish to give an opening statement? Yes, it'll be very short, I assure you. Please. Honourable Mr Chair and other honourable members, thank you for inviting me to this hearing. I'll speak briefly, as it is now six years since I last sat in the colonial jurisdiction, and I'm not up to date with changes which may have been made in that time. My two learned colleagues provide you with further details on some areas. However, I believe nothing has altered to address the major discrepancies with other states, which I witnessed during my years as state coroner. I realised then how important the coronial jurisdiction is, not only for the bereaved, but for victims of natural disasters and all those concerned with justice. I realised how much more could be achieved with full resources and independence, answerable only to the Attorney General, as the specialist area which it is, rather than being a subsidiary of the local court. I observe with envy the Victorian system with its independence, and 14 coroners, and New Zealand's 21, compared to the then five recently become six full-time coroners in New South Wales, with its considerably larger population. Then and now, Victoria has a coronial prevention unit of up to 21 researchers who coordinate, disseminate recommendations and publicise. New South Wales has effectively none. The Victorian attorney appoints coroners in consultation with the state coroner. In New South Wales, the state coroner has virtually no input into appointments, which are always from the ranks of the local court, and coroners, as a matter of practice, are liable to be moved back to the general magistracy every three years, thus both failing to achieve the standard of the most skilled and suitable personnel, and often wasting experience learned, which takes a year or two to develop. Coronial work is significantly different from that of a general magistrate. In New South Wales, country magistrates with heavy daily workloads are expected to undertake some coronial work, while having neither the opportunity properly to gain full experience and training in that field, or the benefits of the collegiate system pertaining in Sydney's head office, head uh, coroner's court, amongst the full-time coroners. With more full-time coroners, regional matters should be handled from Sydney, either by bringing cases in or by a cor coroner travelling to the locale, as occurs now only with major matters. Finally, to provide the authority and dignity to the jurisdiction which it requires, in my view, the state coroner should be a judge as in Victoria and New Zealand. The public deserves such a reflection of the importance of this specialist area, which should be seen to be acknowledged by government. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Dillon? Thank you. Yes, I do have some remarks. Um, I, I time myself. This will take about three and a half minutes, so forgive me if I run over the three minutes. Thank you. I thank the Select Committee for the invitation to give evidence at this important inquiry. I'm speaking to you from Dremoyne, which is traditional Wangal country. I respectfully acknowledge the elders and traditional custodians of the lands on which this inquiry is taking place. This inquiry and the government's response to it will probably shape the coronial system for generations. In the past 30 years, fundamental changes in the philosophy and practice of coronership have been prompted by inquiries around Australia and internationally. In New South Wales, however, serious reform has been resisted within the local court. The result is a suboptimal death investigation system, which particularly disadvantages people living in country and regional New South Wales. Why does this matter? because it implies a lack of proper respect for the dead and their bereaved relatives, and a, a failure to recognise the common humanity of ourselves and those who are mourning and the dead. 
because it inflicts additional unnecessary suffering on people who have the misfortune to be drawn into the colonial system, because we don't learn all the lessons we should from preventable deaths, because government agencies and agents involved in deaths are not always held fully to account, and because opportunities for healing and restorative justice are missed. So what is to be done? The great management thinker Peter Drucker argued, to make service institutions and service staffs perform does not require genius. It requires first, clear objecti objectives and goals. Next, it demands priorities on which resources can be concentrated. It requires further, clear measurements of accomplishment. <clears throat> and finally, it demands organized abandonment of the obsolete. The coronial jurisdiction falls short on all four Drucker criteria. Its statutory goals and priorities lack clarity. It lacks a strategic plan to meet its objectives. Its KPIs and measurements of performance are inadequate and in some respects misleading, uh, such as the overemphasis on high clearance rates. And finally, the Coroner's Act with its obsolete arrangements of the Chief Magistrate having control and direction of the jurisdiction and of country magistrates acting as coroners reflects an anachronistic concept of coronership that has been abandoned in every other jurisdiction in Australia. And I may say uh, practically everywhere else in the Commonwealth. The, the coronial system has a number of real strengths, especially the people who work within it and its culture of compassion. The committee has read some heartbreaking stories in submissions, but there are also stories of healing and catharsis. Nevertheless, the, the system and its structure make it harder than it should be to produce healing outcomes and to prevent future deaths. To build on its strengths, we need a new act and a new specialist court. We need coordination of the whole multidisciplinary system. We need resources to meet the system's objectives in a timely, timely and human, humane way. We need a much more serious commitment to prevention of death. The coroners and the system as a whole need proper KPIs and reporting mechanisms. And those who are suffering need more therapeutic and restorative processes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Barnes. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to just make a few remarks about what I say is one of the essential characteristics of a reformed coronial system, the need for all coronial work to be undertaken by specialist full-time coroners. In my submission, support for the proposition that all coronial work should be done by specialist full-timers can be found in three characteristics of coronial work. One, the need for esoteric ex expertise. Two, the profound difference between an adjudicator and an, inquisit and an inquisitor. And three, the logistical challenges that invariably confront part-time magistrate coroners. If we turn to expertise first, an effective coroner must be able to recognise and balance competing priorities, the investigation, death prevention, and the assuaging of bereavement. What circumstances justify giving precedence to one over the others and to what extent? Should the body be brought to the government mortuary for autopsy or tests? What level of autopsy should be ordered? Should tissue and organs be retained? Which family members' views should be preferred? When should those views be overruled? To whom should the body be released? When should an operating theatre or other death scene remain unchanged? And when can the body be moved and cleaned for family viewing? When should family be given access to the death scene? What material can be released to family members and when? Should an inquest be held to generate recommendations? What recommendations can be made? Many slight variations in circumstances can mandate a different answer to each of these questions. And those answers can't be found in legal texts or judicial authorities. They depend upon the coroner having sufficient trade craft, which can only be developed with considerable experience that unfortunately is unlikely to be available to a part-time regional magistrate coroners. The other experts involved in coronial cases, the detectives, the pathologists, the various specialist investigators will offer 
conflicting advice based on the perspective of their respective disciplines. The coroner has to be sufficiently experienced and confident to know which to follow in any given case. I turn now to the question of an inquisitor. With no parties to determine the course of the investigation or the inquest, the coroner must be comfortable to take the lead and must have sufficient understanding of the contributing disciplines to know what steps are warranted, to do everything that is necessary, but only what is necessary. It's not a homicide investigation, except when it is. Anticipating at an early stage what is needed to be done to answer the likely questions of interested parties and to enable the coroner to make the required statutory findings is a very different task from adjudicating on whether the evidence the parties to a criminal or civil action that have chosen to put before the court has discharged their onus. Expertise in one type of proceeding does not necessarily equip one to adequately preside over and manage the other. There is a huge range of possible investigative responses to most reportable deaths. Do too much, order too many tests, or require too many witness statements, and the whole matter will be unnecessarily prolonged. The system can get clogged up and bogged down with terrible results. Conversely, the failure to order a particular test may result in a permanent loss of the opportunity to do so, resulting in key questions being unable to be answered. Regional magistrate coroners who only handle a few cases each year may never develop sufficient experience to make these calls. While they wrestle with the issues, the family is waiting to get the body back of their loved one so that they can proceed with the grieving and the death ceremonies and waiting for answers about why their loved one has died and whether it could have been avoided. And the third and last aspect I want to address are logistics. In the hours and days following a reportable death, key decisions must be made in a timely manner based on ready access to vital information. In order to make properly informed decisions in relation to the various matters that I've already referred to, a coroner may need access to medical histories, death scene photographs, the views of family members, the opinions of pathologists and detectives. Often this information can't simply be requisitioned all at once. The answer to one question needs to be considered and frequently leads to another and so on. At the beginning or the end of a court day, regional magistrate coroners frequently have to drive from one centre to another. Even if they are presiding in the centre in which they reside, a regional magistrate usually has a lengthy list to manage or a contested trial to hear. It can be difficult for a magistrate in that situation to process the information as it comes in and to consider what more might need to be discovered. Making decisions on the corner of the desk as they move between matters or move between court centres is far from ideal. In some regions, it's not unusual for the body to be in one town, the coroner's clerk to be in another, and the coroner to be in a third area. Information uh, and communication technology is frequently unreliable. And while all of these issues are juggled with, the family in their most vulnerable time are asking for answers that unfortunately they frequently don't get. That's all I'd like to say at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I thank you all three for your uh, opening statements and for your submissions in writing. And Professor Dillard, I think yours is uh, very comprehensive. Um, with the indulgence of committee members, I might commence the questioning. Um, my, my first questions are, are to the two former uh, coroners, Mr Barnes and Ms Jerram. In the legislation as it currently stands, the coroner and the deputy state coroners must be magistrates. Uh, all magistrates are automatically coroners, but there is a provision in the Act for people to be appointed coroners who are not otherwise magistrates. Has the government ever availed itself in your experience uh, and appointed people as coroners who, who are not also magistrates? No, as far as as far as I'm aware, apart from the last few years, I'd, and Mr. Barnes may know a little bit more recent, but 
No, n never appointed directly from outside. Okay. The, only, the only time I'm aware of it happening is when it's been necessary to bring a coroner from another state to deal with a matter that local coroners couldn't deal with because of a potential conflict. But in each case that I'm aware of that happening, the person who's been brought from another state has been a coroner in the state in which they usually reside. Sorry, could I just, could I just add something to that? Um, when the 2009 Act was, uh, was drafted, there were a, uh, a small number of uh, registrars who had who were coroners and the act I think was drafted so as to enable them to continue on as coroners so for example at the uh, at the Glebe coroner's court uh, I think the registrar was a coroner and also the executive officer was a coroner and there were one or two people in the country so I think that was the reason um, it, it, the, the act as it as you as you read it literally it seems to suggest that uh, people who are not not magistrates could be appointed for particular inquests or something like that but i i think it's more it was more to protect public service positions than for any other reason that the act was drafted that way but here okay. i don't think that anybody after the 2009 act anyone who was a registrar continued to carry out coronial duties, not in my experience anyway. Whereas when I was magistrate at Goulburn before, uh, well before that act, the clerk of the court, as he then was called, did almost all the coronial matters and he wasn't legally trained. He did them quite well, I think, but he wasn't legally trained at all. So I just, yes, I don't. Um, well, 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 I, uh, Mary, I can tell you that Don McLennan, for example, at Glebe was a coroner. He, he, he was a yeah, commissioner as a coroner and he only did natural cause deaths. But that's why he, he kept he kept that uh, that um, commission, I suppose. He was allowed to do that. And there was a man at uh, Gosford also. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it was an anomaly. Okay. I'd just like to turn to now to the issue of resourcing. Um, uh, Mr Barnes, in your submission at paragraph 26, you make the point that the resourcing of the coroner's jurisdiction here in New South Wales on a per capita basis is about half that of Victoria and Queensland. And I think, Mr Dillon, you attach one of Mr Barnes's analysis of the review of government spending at page 80, I think, of your submission and the funding of the New South Wales coronial jurisdiction compared to other states is anywhere between 45 and 60%. Um, what impact is that uh, significantly lower level of resourcing having on the outputs and the ability of the coronial jurisdiction to meet its existing statutory charter, apart from any kind of greater aspiration that people might have for the jurisdiction? In my experience, it means that matters which should go to inquest or should be further investigated don't receive that level of attention simply because the coroners don't have the capacity to do it. You simply have to finalise about as many matters are coming in or you'll get buried in a backlog. And that's only achieved by dispensing with inquests uh, expeditiously, even though there might be legitimate questions that you would otherwise choose to investigate. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dillon? Um, yeah, it, it, I, it's it's one of the most frustrating aspects of working as a coroner. Um, if you think about it, forty percent of deaths uh, reported in New South Wales, around about that number, are unnatural deaths. And that's that's in the order of uh, two and a half thousand deaths per annum, maybe more, even up to three thousand. Um, of, of which uh, only around about 100 go to inquest. Now, given the Act only allows you to make recommendations if you hold an inquest, there's an enormous um, pond or reservoir of, of preventable deaths that we're, we're, we're not addressing at all. Now, of course, you could tackle that in different ways if the Act allowed you to do that. But at the moment, uh, five full-time coronet positions simply cannot cope with that enormous 
uh, number of preventable deaths, much less the country coroners. The country coroners do hardly any inquests at all. And, and of the inquests they do do, uh, very few result in recommendations to prevent future deaths. So the system's just uh, just not tackling that problem as it should should be doing. Uh, Mr Dillon, I see on your second submission, I think at page three, you say, uh, I think you raised the prospect that maybe like in Ontario, the New South Wales legislation should be expanded to allow coroners to make recommendations out, rising out of investigations, not only out of the actual inquests. Would that be a, a, a significant reform measure that could be recommended here? Well, I think it is, but um, <clears throat> you, uh, not if not if unqualified amateur coroners were, were doing it. I, one of the I remember talking about this with with Michael Barnes some years ago, and we both concluded that it was a good idea in theory, but you wouldn't want to let a lot of the people, the country magistrate, uh, start making recommendations um, because they simply didn't have the expertise to do so. So the expertise problem that Michael talked about earlier uh, is um, is an impediment to adopting that kind of system, I think. Okay. I note, Mr Dillon, in your submission, and I think it arises elsewhere, you make the point that there's no specific training given to people to be coroners. Now, I'm of the understanding that when people become magistrates or judges, the Judicial Commission does provide a certain level of basic training uh, for new appointees. But would I be right in assuming, and maybe the people who were the coroner can confirm or, or embelly, uh, elaborate on this, that people who are made coroners do not get specific coronial training before they commence duties? Is that is my understanding correct? Well, there's a little bit of training. Um, it did improve. Uh, when Mary was appointed, we started getting people who were new, newly appointed magistrates who were about to go into their country service would come and spend a little bit of time at the coroner's court. The problem is it, it, it takes time to develop expertise. I would say it took me uh, probably a couple of years before I felt I was competent. And I, we were all doing six or 700 cases a year. If you're doing 20 cases a year or 10 cases a year, even with some training in Sydney before you go off to the, to the regions, you're just not going to develop expertise. Um, and the training really that I would say I got was from basically on the job, hanging out with more experienced coroners. You know, I'd go around to talk to Mary or Michael or whoever, I've got a problem, you know, blah, 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 how do we solve this? Or talk to counsel assisting, or talk to the pathologists, or talk to the police investigators, or whatever. So it's, it's an entirely different sort of, um, uh, sort of training. It's kind of like an apprenticeship rather than um, theoretical training that you might, might get. And don't forget that most people who are appointed as magistrates have come from the criminal law. Um, you know, they're DPP lawyers or legal aid lawyers or ALS lawyers. And they go, and the, the, the local court is basically a specialist criminal court. So you're already a specialist in your, your specialist field when you're appointed to a specialist court. But coroners, as Mary said, coronial work is completely different. And as Michael mm -hmm. said, completely different. So training, Training has to be done in the coroner's court. Okay. Ms. Jerem, does that accord with your experience? Yes, it does. Um, as Hugh says, it was just as towards the end of my term that people began to be given slightly more, if they came in as a coroner, slightly more training. The only other training they had, though, was that tw twice a year, the, the regions have a three-day conference. And there was usually a coronial component in that. But, you know, these are people who are away from home for three days. They'd get an hour's lecture and question and answer from me or Hugh or subsequently Michael, whoever was presenting. And that was really the extent of their training once they were in a country area. So, Mr. Barnes? 
Can, can I just say one more thing? That sure. I think it was Mr. Barnes talking about um, preventable, and and or was it Hugh? The, and the number of inquests at the moment, for example, I understand the state coroner is hearing is a, an inquiry into bushfires. Now there are twenty five deaths that had to be investigated. It's it's not finished yet, so I won't comment on anything about it in particular, but that sort of factor is growing daily with natural disasters like floods and bushfires and climate change, and they're not being catered for. How can they be with only six full-time positions in New South Wales? I think the government in its submission makes the point there's 5.3 full-time equivalent judicial officers given to the coronial function here in New South Wales. Yes. Um, Mr. Barnes, did you have any views on training? I agree with both of no, other members to question. I agree with both of what my former colleague has said. I just draw attention to one other extra aspect that makes it even more important that proper training be arranged. If I'm a criminal barrister, I'm appearing in criminal courts on a daily basis. I fairly well understand the role of the person on the bench because they do it mostly in front of me, apart from going to their chambers to write decisions. Whereas if I'm an experienced coronial advocate, I participate in inquests. But as we know, that's only 10% of the work of a coroner. I have no exposure to the other 90% of the work that coroners do on a daily basis. And there is no exposure for that sort of work for people at private practice. So I come to the court even less well equipped to discharge the role than where I going as a criminal barrister to, to a, a general court list. Good point. Mm. Um, I have many other questions, but I might throw to other committee members, starting with Mr. Shoebridge, to ask their questions. Oh, thanks, Chair, and thanks all of you for being here. We really don't have enough time with you, so I'll try and be quick. Can I ask first about resourcing? The um, report on government services data seems to be questionable at best. Um, I think Mr. Dillon, sorry, that was a cat launching itself through my house. Um, uh, the report on government seems to be questionable at best, um, suggesting that the New South Wales spend is $990 per finalised case as against the national average of 2,195. Now that seems to be because it's very hard to work out what the coroner's court does in New South Wales costing the regional work, costing the registry work, costing the forensics work. Um, can any of you shed some light on the actual funding? I defer to my uh, more learned colleagues about that. I haven't done any research recently into that. I agree. Hugh has done more work, but I think Mary's crude measure is still the most valuable. Five and a half or six magistrates in a state yeah. as big as New South Wales compared to the rest of the country is ludicrous. Yeah, that's a good reality check, Mr. Dillon. Um, yeah, well, it is. Um, it's the reality check, really. Um, I was thinking about this last night, to be honest. Um, if you, I, I, I think, uh, I think New South Wales is doing it on the cheap. I was trying to, if, if nine hundred ninety dollars per case is um, is. Uh, the spend on the Libcom effort in uh, um, and, and it uh, divided into six and a half thousand cases. I think that gives you uh, a case cost of around about eighteen eighteen hundred dollars. Um, this is very very rough, and and the government should be doing it itself, of course. Um, but I, I, my feeling is that. Queensland probably, uh, because it's it's the most comparable jurisdiction, it spends around about uh, $2,200 per case. And I think if we take that number, that's probably what it costs per case in New South Wales. Um, but, you know, what the real number is, I have no idea, and the government doesn't make any effort, and the local court makes no effort to try and work out what the real cost is. But Queensland has seven or eight, I think eight coroners now. Uh, we have five and there's, there's going to be a new one appointed. So coming up to six, I mean, it's still a, a woeful effort really when you compare, I, I think uh, New Zealand, for example, now has 26 up from 21. Um, 
this population. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, could I ask you about some of the, the government then responds with other data trying to yeah. suggest that there's no problems in New South Wales. One is the clearance rate. They That's say rubbish. The clearance rate for cases in New South Wales is comparable to what it is in Victoria, so there's nothing to see here. Um, do any of you have any comments on that? Tom? Yes, I do. I, look, this is a this is a classic case of picking a statistic that supports a particular view, but it's so misleading. It's it's it it's really outrageous, frankly. I don't blame the government for this, really, because this I, this overemphasis on clearance rates, as though it explains everything, comes from the local court. That's what the local court would like to tell everybody is going on. Well, I, I excuse the, the new chief magistrate. Why it's misleading is this. Um, all a clearance rate tells you is how fast files are opened and closed. They don't tell you anything about the quality of the investigation that, that's done on them. So as we were talking earlier about uh, the number of uh, cases which should go to inquest but are not, they all contribute to a high clearance rate, but they don't. But what we can say about those cases is the uh, the adequacy of the um, of the investigation isn't being investigated itself. So, in other words, a clearance rate seems to suggest that nothing is wrong and that we've got a very efficient system, whereas it's actually hiding a lack of investigation. If you look at another. Uh, jurisdiction, say Victoria, where they have a 93% clearance rate, that might suggest actually that they're putting a greater effort into investigating the true causes of and circumstances of deaths. So a clearance rate can be utterly misleading in itself. Mm -hmm. Of course, you should have high clearance rates if you can, but you should be doing good investigations simultaneously. Quality should not be uh, dismissed um, at the expense of quantity, and that's Jeremy, Mr. Barnes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Barnes. Clearance rates are the mechanism by which overworked coroners cope with too much work. Unlike any other jurisdictions, if you if you get a traffic ticket, you can demand a hearing. In the coronial jurisdiction, that's not the case. You can ask for an inquest, but the coroner has to choose to give you one, or you go to the Supreme Court if you can afford that to get an order that an inquest be held. So coroners manage their workload simply by dispensing with matters. Uh, you could say that it's a, an easy way out for people who don't want to do more work than they need to. I don't think that's the case. I think it's overworked magistrates coping with too much work by simply dispensing, and that's reflected positively for them. They've got a great clearance rate. And I mean, sorry, Ms. Jerome, did you have something to say? I don't want to sound just like an echo, but I completely agree with what both Mr. Dillon and Mr. Barnes have just said. Um, the clearance rate really doesn't reflect anything other than pressure on the coroners and nothing about quality. And when you take into account what I mentioned earlier about the increase in major accidental deaths having to be, well, sorry, major incidents like bushfires having to be investigated it, it it throws any figures out anyway i mean who would have imagined the lint cafe matter or that which took up mr barnes time almost totally for over a year or now the bushfires and, and, and we see we see some of that in the, the the ongoing downward trend in the number of actual hearings held that's also reflected yes. in, in that overwork, isn't it? And is a good quality check if, if you're testing whether or not the system is doing what you want it to do, which is interrogate the reasons and rationale for deaths and, and look for recommendations if they're not having hearings. Mm. You, you obviously have a fairly clear insight, Mr. Shoebridge, may I say. Oh, Mr. You can keep answering questions. Um, <laughs> Mr. Shoebridge, we, we, we might move to Mr. Roberts and then to Ms. Sharp uh, and then circle back. Mr. Roberts. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you the, for your attendance today and your detailed submissions as well. I just want to take the real practicality side, if I may, and um, it's open to either or any one of the three of you to answer. Section 23 
um, mandatory inquests. Obviously, it adds to the workload of COGS. Do you think that we could, and I understand the logic and the reasoning behind mandatory inquests, but do you think that that section or that particular part of the legislation could be looked at? Whereas the death or bring in custody, and let's just use a corrective services facility, the death is clearly of a natural cause. Do you think there's a way that we could work the system so that that doesn't become a mandatory uh, inquest? I I would agree that that's probably not necessary and that when it's pretty clear that it's a natural cause, but only if it is clear that it's a natural cause could it be dispensed with, in my view. Otherwise, the mandatories are normally, they're often to do with concerns about the prison officers' treatment of prisons or the police treatment of um, perpetrators or possible perpetrators. And those, I can see why they're mandatory. I would think Michael and Hugh agree with me about that. Uh, I think there are, sorry, I was going to say, I think there are opportunities to make savings. You know that it's a mandatory inquest if the coroner can't be sufficiently certain about the manner of cause of death. Mm. And unfortunately, that's been interpreted to mean if you haven't got a body, then you've got to have an inquest. So someone falls off the 10th floor of a, a cruise liner, their body is recovered and they're found to be terribly injured and have ingested a tonne of water. They get a death certificate that says they've died from a height, fall from a height, causing drowning or injury, no inquest. If you don't find their body and you can't say which was the cause of death, you've got to have an inquest. All missing persons have to go to inquest. So there are, um, another example is homicides. A, a suicide homicide where someone shoots this person and then shoots themselves, mandatory inquest because there's a homicide involved. So there is room where you could do away with or fine tune those. I wouldn't be inclined to take deaths in custody out. I think. Uh, historically, there's been such concern about the quality of healthcare given to people in custody. Um, the Royal Commission, Aboriginal deaths in custody, for example, uh, you know that the, the heat is still around, quite understandably, around that issue. I think to wind back deaths in custody inquests is unnecessary. I think there are other areas you can make savings. But, Mark, I certainly can recall several matters where someone very old and who'd been known to be very ill with something terminal for some time in prison, and there was still a requirement for an inquest. Mind you, we dealt with those pretty quickly. I was say, it's a half day inquest at maximum. Yeah. So. But still, it, it would be one way of cutting back a little bit. Sure. I just don't know how many of those there are, Mr. Roberts. Um, I can't tell you a figure on those. Uh, this is this is Hugh Gill, and if I could just add a little bit to that, there are questions sometimes about the quality of care given to dying prisoners, um, and uh, there are concerns, of course, about uh, particularly from Aboriginal families about the quality of care and treatment given in um, in detention. Um, I, I think those are important concerns that that need to be addressed. But I also think that there are possibly different ways of, of uh, running inquests in, in less adversarial ways than, than currently is the case. <clears throat> um, and uh, I've been, in fact, I've been talking recently with the, with the state coroner about a more therapeutic or restorative process, which may be less uh, traumatizing for families, but also it, I may say for uh, prison staff and justice health staff, because uh, there are concerns there about the traumatising effects of inquests on, on those people as well. So I think we, we need to think about the process as well as just numbers of inquests that we, we conduct. Um, thank you. Um, and then just one other question, if I may, Chair, it's on a, a, a different avenue. Um, Clearly from your submissions, and not only yours, but others we've received as well, the Coroner's Court and the Coroner's Act needs a complete overhaul. Um, Mr. Barnes, I think you draw the conclusion, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you, I think, prefer a hybrid model similar to the Children's Court, yet, Mr. Dillon, you prefer a standalone, completely autonomous model. And there's probably merit to both of those. Um, did you add anything further, Mr. Barnes, in relation to the? Uh, I must uh, admit that your 
model infuses me when I when I research it per that existing from a standalone model. Um, but could you expand on that a bit more for us? Sure. Um, if the standalone model is what Victoria has, they have a chief or a state chief coroner, state coroner, and then appointed uh, coroners. They are appointed for a period of five years. They can be reappointed. I don't support that. I can't understand why those judicial officers, unlike any others, wouldn't have permanent tenure. Um, as you know, coroners are frequently required to investigate the performance of state instrumentalities, public hospitals, police forces, corrections, to have your reappointment depending upon you making findings that fall in favour with government, I think is hugely dangerous. Well, that undermines judicial independence for a start. But completely. Mm. It's just inconsistent with judicial independence. Um, and the, the difficulty, though, is that if your only role is to be a coroner and you've got nowhere else to go, if the chief coroner or indeed the coroner, him or herself, comes to the view that this is not what I thought it was going to be, and as I said before, that's frequently going to be the case, or it's, there's a great risk of that being the case, as no one really knows what a coroner does until they get in there, going to mortuaries and watching autopsies be performed and the like. Um, you've got nowhere else to go, and the chief coroner's got to either sack you by not getting it reappointed, or you've got to choose to abandon your career and try and restart your practice that you've been out of for five years. Whereas the hybrid model, um, similar to the, the Children's Court in New South Wales means we've got full-time coroners doing all the work, but we have the potential for local court magistrates to rotate through the court if they, they, can, if they consider that might suit them and if the chief coroner and the chief magistrate are agreeable. It also means that people can take a break. It is very distressing, confronting work and doing it for your whole career is not going to suit everybody. Doing it for five years and going back to the local court is a legitimate uh, alternative. It also means that the coroner's court has a more widely distributed workforce. It has coroners in all of the regional towns. If there is need for a coronial function to be discharged in a local area, um, it gives it a, that surge capacity and that flexibility of workforce. So that's why I prefer that model. On the other hand, um, there's no reason perhaps why someone who wants to be a coroner can't be appointed but as a magistrate and then straight to coroners that because i agree that, that that it's too dangerous to have people just on a contract conflict of interest is the obvious worst problem about that uh, and i'm not quite sure how they deal with that in victoria i did try and speak to my ex-colleague and still friend jennifer Coate, who was state coroner there at the same time i was and who's gone on to greater things since then, as you'll know. But she seemed to think it worked, but I wasn't quite satisfied as to how it did. If someone's on a five year contract, she said, oh, well, they might go back to the bar or to the public service, but they have to have some guarantee of that. What if they didn't want to go? I think they often are renewed, the outsiders who've been appointed, but no, I'm, I'm I think the hybrid option is probably preferable, but it would um, have to be sorry. to be strong conferring between the state coroner and the attorney, as well as with the chief magistrate. And of course, then you often have differences of view. So that's I don't know how you legislate for that. Um, um, well, uh, this is Hugh Dillon. I, I, I have a slightly different view, well, in fact, a, a, quite a, a big difference of view uh, with, with Michael on, on this subject. I prefer the standalone court. Um, I, I must confess I have flirted with the idea of a, of a limited term for coroners, but I, I uh, have changed my mind completely on that. I, um, you need tenured coroners because they do investigate governments and so forth. And we've we've seen in other jurisdictions, uh, you know, all sorts of political appointments, and that's an, a very unsatisfactory thing where people feel they're bound to subconsciously or consciously to find for governments. Um, nevertheless, I think the the real strength of the Victorian model, leaving aside the question of of limited term appointments is that you can recruit from a much wider and deeper pool. Um, we talked about specialists needed in the jurisdiction. Well, if you, if you come from, for example, uh, a background of workers' compensation where you're used to industrial accidents, 
if you come from uh, the public health sector where you're used to dealing with hospitals and root cause analysis and and those sorts of things those are that's it. those are good backgrounds for for coroners to, i think my, and in fact much more suitable backgrounds uh than the criminal law is so although i can see and i i wouldn't die in a ditch over this argument i have to say um well i can see the attractions of a I wouldn't call it a children's court model, I'd call it a Queensland model, where the state coroner and the uh, state, uh, the Queensland coroner's court is linked to, but independent from the, the Queensland magistrate's court. I, I think that works, uh, but I think the problem is that you're drawing your personnel from this pool of Queensland magistrates rather from, than from the wider legal profession. And I, that troubles me. Um, you could have, have separate courts and joint appointments, couldn't you? You could be appointed yes, to both could. the coroner's court and the local court, and that would resolve the, the problem, that if it wasn't yes, working uh, the coroner's court, you could move, but still have independence. Yes. Yeah, like, uh, like, uh, like a reverse of section 16, you could, if you're appointed a coroner, you're also a magistrate, but you're primarily a coroner. Well, in Victoria, they have people from, uh, there are people who are magistrates and there are people who are, coroners um, and the magistrate coroners I, I assume have a have an appointment to the magistrates court of Victoria and can go back as Michael has suggested you know that gives you more um, career flexibility um, but uh, uh, I would uh, personally I would have stayed stayed on as a coroner if, if I hadn't been told that I was going to be rotated out and uh, you know, so I decided I did not want to go back to the local court. So I opted for a career in academia. Um, but I, so you, I, I think I think the coroner's court is the most interesting work that a judicial officer can do in New South Wales. And I was told that on my first day as a coroner uh, by a barrister. Um, I don't know why you would want to leave it if you didn't have to. So you're an unusual man, Mr. Dillon. Oh well. Yes, that's true. What was your comment, um, Mr. Chair? Sorry, I didn't um, hear Mr. Um, I, I will go now, Ms. Sharp, to ask some questions. I forgot to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Barnes, um, I wanted to ask you about your submission in relation to the comments that you made around how uh, coroners deal with bereaved families. Um, you'd be aware and you know, we've, we've previously, most of the members of this committee have previously done the First Nations, uh, deaths in custody and, and, you know, extreme issues of concern um, around that. Not all of it, actually the court's fault, a lot of it leading to, you know, systemic raised by all three of you today. But I was very interested in your just sort of general comments about that intersection between care for the bereaved versus, um, you know, um, procedural fairness. And I was, and I was concerned by your comment about um, whether suicides um, are necessarily being declared suicides, and because of some of that conflict. So I'm really just want to ask you: Do you just want to take us through your thinking about that? I think it is an ongoing problem. Are we going to have a legalistic approach to deaths, a restorative approach, or a preventative approach? And that's what I meant in my opening comments about coroners having to balance competing priorities. If you just want to focus on finding out what happened and making correct decisions about what exactly occurred. You, for example, are happy to leave a body in a death scene all day until all examinations can be made of it, even though that means the body will blow up so it's unrecognisable and that's what you give back to the family. That is giving preeminence to the investigation. Equally, on other occasions, you might say, we're not going to have any autopsy, even though we're not quite sure why the person died, but we are reasonably comfortably satisfied it's natural causes, so we won't have an autopsy because the family has a um, very heartfelt objection to what they would see as mutilation of the body. We're going to release the body to them and make a finding of uh, undetermined natural causes death. That's giving um, prominence to the restorative um, bereavement focus. So on each occasion, you have to make a decision about which, what part of the role is most important. A good example is deaths that occur in a, in a medical setting. The investigation would say, leave everything where it is, come in, take photographs, leave everything connected, 
zip up the body bag and send it off to the mortuary. And so the family can't have any contact with the dead person until it gets to wherever it is. Horrible situations of police demanding that a newborn be given to them so they can take it off to the mortuary while the parents are still wanting some contact with their, their dead child. So it's always a question of which do you, do you prefer? Which outcome are you going to give prominence to? And that's the sort of difficulty that uh, people who've only practiced in the criminal law, I think might have difficulty uh, achieving that balance. And I'm assuming that really, from what you've all said this morning, that the guidance given to coroners, whether they've been there for 10 years or five minutes on these type of issues is basically zero. It's except, really hard to give guidance. It goes, it goes everywhere. Itself. Sorry, Mary, go. Well, except in the collegiate system. Yes. Meaning that if you're all together in one good place, like Lidkin now is, um, there's a lot of discussion goes on. Yeah. And I'm sure that was true when I worked with Mr. Dillon. Unfortunately, Mr. Barnes, although I knew him in que from Queensland, came along after me, so I didn't have that opportunity but there was a lot of discussion and you could always find somebody else to talk things through but that was that was as far as it went uh, this is Hugh Dillon I could I just uh, pick up that yes there is a lot of uh collegiate talking and so forth one of the one of the problems in the system though is that Coronial discretion, as Michael said right at the start, is terribly wired. You can do all sorts of things without anybody looking over your shoulder and telling you not to do that or to do something else. So um, I used to think of the, the whole system as being a bit like a, a, a cottage industry. You know, everybody's working away furiously at their own little set of tasks and, you know, collection of cases and so forth. And there was interaction, of course, but we were more or less left to do our own thing. And I've often thought that this is not the most um, efficient way to use the resources, the limited resources of the system. Um, you know, a little bit, another way of thinking about it is like a, a chamber of barristers. You know, everybody's got their own caseload and so forth. You talk for sure, but you make your own decisions and you do your own stuff. Whereas, I, I used to think that a better model might be um, a firm of solicitors where as a group you took on uh, certain types of work and you concentrated on various objectives and, and that sort of thing. So you, you tried to tackle various kinds of problems um, and the whole body of, of coroners was focused on similar objectives. We don't have that in New South Wales. I think they do in Victoria. I think they have a, a much more focused system in Victoria. Um, but that's, uh, that, that's another problem too, that we have to work out here. Okay, Mr. Khan, did you have any questions? I, I don't want to cut across Penny, um, but- uh, Penny's already, done. Uh, I think um, it, Mr. Khan? Yeah, I, I think it uh, uh, arises actually from those last responses. Um, asking my questions from Tamworth today, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in this, this concept of collegiality arising in Lidcombe um, when uh, the punters can be quite dispersed geographically in New South Wales. So if we go to a system of, in a sense, more permanent coroners, as opposed to the local magistrates doing the coronial work, how are you going to provide timely and eff effective access to the court to those people who are so dispersed? Can I answer that first? Because I've tried both models. Uh, in Queensland, we had um, regional coroners. So there was a coroner in Cairns, a coroner in uh, Townsville, a coroner in Mackay, a coroner on the Gold Coast, and then a cluster of coroners in Brisbane. And that was underpinned by the sorts of issues that you're raising, Mr. Khan, that a coroner should be a member of the community he or she is serving. They're a, a social function rather than a government function. Yeah. And there's an advantage in having a relationship with the local hospital superintendent, with the local chief of police, with the local forensic pathologist. And that was why we set that system up. The problem with it is, is it's single point failure. You've got one coroner, one coroner's clerk, one council assisting, and a couple of, of uh, administrative people, any of them go rogue or go off and your, your system crumbles. So it's been stressful. It had advantages, 
in that they had much better keyed into their with key decision makers in their communities, but they lost the ability to be efficient. And so bit by bit, they've drawn people back to Brisbane. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt before the others speak, uh, speak but I, I think we've seen that in the family law jurisdiction, some of the problems arising with, yeah. uh, with judicial officials sort of not having the support of their, their colleagues in outlying areas. Queensland, indeed, I think. Sorry, uh, to the other contributors. Uh, this is Hugh Dillon. Um, look, I, I've obviously given a great deal of thought to this as well. And um, my feeling is that the Victorian system works uh, as well as any co colonial system can work because you you have that centralization of most functions. You have, nowadays, um, we have these kinds of systems. We have communication systems which can reach families anywhere in the state. Um, the, the system as, as it is currently designed was set up in the early uh, 20th century when magistrates and coroners were still traveling around in steam trains or on horses and buggies. We can do a whole lot better than that and provide a much better service than that. And uh, in terms of being uh, a local coroner, if the coroners did inquests or if they tried to make recommendations which prevented local deaths, I think there might be an argument for keeping coroners in the locality, but they actually don't. Uh, very rarely do you see, um, see this being done. In fact, I did a study over a 10 year period. I think there were 30 cases in which uh, regional coroners made recommendations to prevent future deaths. So that's three a year out of 6,000 cases or, or you know, 3,000 cases being reported in country areas. Uh, it's just not a system that works very well. And who goes to, who just drops into a local court to see their local magistrate? Well, only people who are going to court. You know, nobody has a, a personal relationship with a coroner or a magistrate unless they are, have, have a real problem. Um, I, I, I don't... I don't see the coroners as sort of social workers or, you know, a local grandee helping out in their local community very much. Um, with time is running short, Mr. Schubert, you had a question and then I might finish up with a couple of Yeah, questions. and I'm sorry to throw this to you at the end, but one of the big issues that's raising pretty much, well, a great many of the submissions, but particularly your submissions, is there's very little guidance in the Act about what the coroner should be focusing on. We have a lot of ad hoc practices done by individual magistrates. And one of the big issues is, should the focus be on the immediate cause of death? And there may be cases where that's what families and everybody wants if there's a potential homicide. The immediate cause of death may be the, the, very, the very core focus. But there are other cases where you actually want to have a systems analysis. Maybe the medical, maybe the, the hospital system failed, maybe the um, there was a failure within the within the um, within the jails, and and how do we need different practices for those two different forms of inquiry? Does the Act need to specify this? Uh, can, can I have a crack at that? This is Hugh Dillon. Look, uh, oh, sorry, Mary. It still comes back to the individual judicial officer, like everything else, like saying, should the Criminal Act tell district court judges and magistrates, just exactly what they should be focusing on. I mean, over time it becomes fairly clear, but I would have thought you can't expect the act to do more. It's not a good act, I don't suggest otherwise, and it's all over the place. But it doesn't, and I don't think it should, uh, be split into different categories. I think that's got to be up to good coroners and sorry just for a moment and then i'll sh shush but for mr khan your question about tamworth or involving tamworth as an example it's probably for the same reason that regional that country magistrates aren't appointed for more than a few years because you can become and i was golden magistrate for some years i loved it but you can become too involved in local matters so that you go to the bank or something and they say, oh, what happened with Mr. So-and-so's matter today? I would think that could be a problem too if you had a purely regional coroner. 
based in towns like Tamworth. On the other hand, coroners do, the, the, the full-time ones go out to the regions, and I think that should be chosen on a as-needs basis, which ones are brought to Sydney and which ones should, the, the coroner should go out with the team. And then it's best to be a bit remote, I think. Anyway, sorry, that's my say. Sorry, could I very briefly um, respond to Mr. Shoebridge's question? The, the starting point always in any death investigation is um, who died, when, when and where did they die, what was the physiological cause and what brought about the death. So that will happen in every case. But the question of how did this death come about, as you say, may raise systems issues. And that's where, going back to Michael's opening remarks, you need people who can spot those systems issues when they mm -hmm. arise, who know, who can distinguish between a case that has a simple answer and a case that has a much more complex answer. And that isn't people who, who have no experience, no training and no resources, namely country magistrates. Can I um, say this? Sorry, Mr. Shubridge, your, your interest about um, ob objectives and what we're seeking to achieve, if you're interested in looking at that further, the Victorian Act has a lengthy list of guiding principles, which I think is essential and we would definitely recommend importing that into our legislation. And Ms. Sharpen, your question about hesitancy in making suicide findings, I know that is a bigger problem for country <laughs> magistrate coroners who know the family, who couldn't possibly bring that shame upon the family, so-called, because of the terrible artificial stigma surrounding suicide. Um, look, we're, we're running short of time, but I might just conclude by, I have a couple of propositions that I might just put to the panel. And if you could just sort of indicate yes or no, and if you need to elaborate, maybe you could answer on notice. Um, the Civil and Administrative Tribunal is headed up by a Supreme Court judge. And the Drug Court is populated by district court judges. The work of the, of the coronial jurisdiction in New South Wales is no less important than either of those two bodies. You would agree with that? Absolutely. Agree. Okay. South, uh, Western Australia has a Supreme Court judge as a state coroner. Okay. He's not called a judge, but the same level of conditions. Okay, I take that. I, I note that in Victoria, they've got the, um, the crime prevention unit, which uses coronial data to identify trends and patterns of preventable deaths identify vulnerable populations, deals with sort of systems information and also provides or tries to provide a robust evidentiary base to assist coroners in, the, in, in writing more meaningful recommendations. I take it you would advocate, and I think Mr Dillon says in his submission, that we should have such a body underpinning the coronial jurisdiction here? I certainly did, Mr Sir. Um, and I think it's enormously important. It also raised the standard, for example, of recommendations made. The prevention unit would ensure that the recommendations made were collated and they're not really very well in New South Wales. And then if there was another similar type death that showed that those recommendations hadn't been taken up, one of the jobs of that prevention unit in Victoria was to make sure that that was made public. I think that was a very strong weapon, actually. It meant that recommendations were listened to. Not all coronial findings are made public in New South Wales. They're not all published. Shouldn't all coroner's decisions be published in New South Wales? There's a step before that. There should be a finding in all cases. In New South yep. Wales, there are only findings if you have an inquest. The rest okay. of the country, you do chambers findings in all cases. All you get here is a letter saying you're not getting an inquest and you're not getting anything else other than date and time and cause of death. So we should have findings in every matter and they should all be yes. published. Okay. Yes, or uh, publishable. Now coroners, okay. now, coroners can make their recommendations, but they don't have the power to, to follow up. And I think, Mr Dillon, you recommended some kind of follow-up power, maybe resulting in reports to Parliament if there is continued non-compliance, is that? Yes, that's correct. And and you have that in other other jurisdictions. Um, interestingly, the uh, New South Wales Ombudsman has a similar, has that kind of a power that if recommendations or uh, are not 
are not responded to or if there is an unsatisfactory response uh, under the Ombudsman Act, the Ombudsman can make a report to Parliament and it has to be tabled. Um, so uh, we, we now have a, a deaths in custody and a deaths in police operations report that's tabled every year by the state coroner. Um, I, th I think that should be done every year in relation to all recommendations. And there should be and there should be a power to follow up. The state coroner should have a power to follow up and see what's happening with with uh, with recommendations, certainly. All right. Well, we could go on for some time, but I'm being chastised by my colleagues for letting the hearing run over time. I want to thank the three of you for your submissions and your evidence today. Um, committee members may have supplementary questions, which they will place on notice. Uh, and I think if that happens, you'll have, I think it's 21 days to respond. Um, as Mr. Shoebridge has reminded me, uh, the one hour was never going to be long enough given the, the, the detail of the material, but um, uh, I, I for one will certainly have some questions to put on notice for you. Happy to. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll take a short break, probably, I don't know, is five minutes enough for the committee secretariat and the members? And then we'll come back to the, the second session. Um, Mr. Dillon, Ms. Jerram, Mr. Barnes, thank you very much for your input. All right. I now ne welcome our next witness, uh, Mr. David Evenden of uh, the Legal Aid Commission of New South Wales. Uh, Mr. Evenden, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you give evidence today and swear either an oath or an affirmation uh, from the details that have been emailed to you by the Secretariat? Thank you. My name is David Evenden and I represent Legal Aid New South Wales and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, now, Mr Evenden, you've given a, a submission on behalf of the Legal Aid Commission of New South Wales, submission uh, number 46, and I think you have emailed uh, some documents to the Secretariat this morning which we will take to be tabled documents. Uh, would you like to commence by making a short opening statement of no more than a couple of minutes? Yes, I would. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the invitation to give evidence today. Legal Aid New South Wales operates the only specialist coronial advice and legal representation service within New South Wales. Until several years ago, it was the only service of its kind in Australia. Since 2006, our coronial inquest unit and other lawyers from within Legal Aid have provided representation to families in many inquests and legal advice and assistance to countless others. Something like 40% of all families represented before the coroner's court have their representation provided by Legal Aid. At the moment in New South Wales, we operate within a coronial system that is in many respects archaic, grossly underfunded and lacking effectiveness. It's been like this for a number of years and the situation is now chronic. It's demonstrated most obviously through the lengthy delays in inquests being heard and finalised. About 6,000 families every year experience the loss of a loved one in New South Wales that is reported to the coroner. It's important to note that just a handful of these matters become inquests. And of those that do, a large proportion are deaths in custody and deaths as a result of police operations. Section 23 to deaths, inquests that the law says must be conducted. Families wait, usually for years, before inquest proceedings get heard. Other families wanting information about the death of a loved one or for an inquest to take place are routinely denied that information in our experience or refused an inquest. This is the more opaque side of the coronial system. Over 5,900 reportable deaths each year never pr proceed to inquest. That's more than 98% of the total. And as you've already heard today, most explicitly and clearly from um, past state coroner Barnes, matters that should be going to inquest are not because of resourcing issues, because there are not enough coroners. The families of people that die from reportable deaths and often avoidable deaths deserve better. The commu community at large also deserves better. Sudden and unexpected deaths can, can happen to anyone. Not only should the coronial system serve families of the deceased and provide them with answers, 
but it should have a preventative function so that the fruits of the system, the findings and recommendations made by coroners, bring about systemic change, real changes to our hospitals, mental health care, our jails, or the operation of our police force. And yet we have in New South Wales an ineffective system for the implementation of coronial recommendations. No legislative imperative for agencies to act nor even report, and often a complete disjuncture between the good work of the coroner and the hope that it might be embraced by the government of the day. There's an overriding need for better resourcing within the coronial system, not only of coroners and those that support and assist them, but also the legal services that are available for families. For a family, having a lawyer means they have a voice. They can get answers in this foreign and often bewildering system. Legal representation of families brings integrity and rigour to the process and serves an important therapeutic role. Put quite simply, legal aid and the Aboriginal legal service do not have the resources they need to adequately provide proper representation and assistance to all families that require it. It's highly likely Aboriginal people through New South Wales are overrepresented in deaths reported to the coroner. Much more can be done to cater for those from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, and in particular, the many Aboriginal people that come into contact with the coronial system. The coroner's court, forensic medicine, and New South Wales police, all of them have a role to play. It's a sign of a civilised society that it's willing and able to review certain deaths, especially avoidable deaths, and learn from its mistakes, more so that it's willing to support the families of those that die in avoidable or unusual circumstances, giving them hope that some change may come about through the death of their loved one. Our written submission came, contains 25 recommendations which, if implemented, Legal Aid New South Wales considers would dramatically improve the coronial system in New South Wales and in particular, the situation for families. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Evenden, for that opening statement. Uh, we might commence by questions from um, from committee members. I think, Mr. Shoebridge, you had some questions. Um, yeah, Mr. Evenden, thank you very much for the very detailed submission that you've given with a series of recommendations. Given legal aid has the broadest practice, the broadest experience across the state about how the system works, we've had a number of submissions concerned about a two-tier system with part-time coroners and magistrates in the regions and um, specialist coroners in the city with all of the support services around Lidcombe. What's, your, what's legal aid's experience of that? Is there a two-tier system um, for, for, for the coroner's court? And if so, what's the impact of it? Well, I think um, when, when we look at coronial expertise, the greatest coronial expertise is, is clearly concentrated in the uh, Lidcombe Coroner's Court, where we have specialist coroners who are, who are doing that work the entire time. Um, then there are um, many, many reportable deaths that are dealt with on a regional basis by uh, local court magistrates. and. Uh, there is a real inconsistency in what happens in the regions. The system, I think, is so uh, broken that there's a lot of things happening that we probably don't even know about. But certainly from the experience of our service, we have many people from regional locations, uh, a large proportion of them, or, or at least some proportion of them being Aboriginal, who are getting in touch because they're getting no information from the local coroner's court. They might have been refused an inquest or refused access to information. There's no real guidance provided to these regional coroners. And I think the comments that have already been made um, in the session earlier today about the ability of a full-time regional criminal law magistrate to do coronial on top of their work are, are very well made comments. But certainly um, it's our service that's interacting on, on a regular, regular basis with people from all throughout the state who are having these difficulties with um, local coroners. At the other end of the spectrum, we have some very good coronial inquiries that take place under the 
direction of the state coroner and deputy state coroners at Lidcom and also throughout other parts of the state, for example, Newcastle um, in particular. And um, those inquiries with the assistance of, of um, services such as the Crown Solicitor's Office are really um, high class inquiries. Of course, they take a long time before they are reached, but we, we have very good analysis of systems that are taking place. And then, as I've indicated in my opening statement, a complete failure when it comes to implementation or any sort of accountability in relation to the recommendations. Well, is it too simplistic to say that under the current system, there are basically two classes of deaths, two classes of grieving families, those in the regions who get part-time coroners and, um, and, and, a sub, and a substandard service, and those in the cities that get full-time coroners with a full suite of services. Is it too simplistic to look at it as a two separate classes? In fact, I think it is. I think it is because there's also many people uh, or families where deaths are reported to the state coroner's court where they also are not getting the information that they need. They're not getting the updates. Matters are getting dispensed with by those same coroners um, that you heard Coroner Barnes or ex-Coroner Barnes talking about the need to simply dispense with matters because of the, the volume of work. Um, that's happening at Lidcombe as it is happening throughout the state. And, and those those resource constraints you, you find is a, is a practical daily reality for the work you have with families wanting to have inquests, is that right? There, they're resource constraints, but as we've also um, raised in our submission, there's a real problem with the practice in the jurisdiction and particularly the provision of information to families. So um, there's no onus on coroners at the moment by way of any sort of um, legislative provision or practice direction to provide information to families. Um, we've just had a a practice note three, which applies to section 23 deaths, which does touch on the need to, or does deal with the need to inform families. But again, there's no provision that mandates that, that investigation materials, so I'm talking about witness statements, CCTV, be provided at an early stage to families. And chapter nine of our um, submission covers that, and we've in fact, made two recommendations which we say would change that system, reversing the onus completely so that families are required to be given information by the coroner. Um, and, and, and that direction should be clear to deputy state coroners, to regional coroners, because what's actually happening is often families, whether it's in the regions or at Lidcombe, are being denied information or not getting it for a, a long, long time. And it's a source of, of great uh, frustration and, and in fact, increased um, distress for them. Uh, Mr. Abenden, both the New Zealand and Victorian legislation, I think, provides that kind of onus, doesn't it? The Victorian legislation, it's covered in our, our submission to an extent, but the, the Victorian legislation, in the same way that the New South Wales legislation does, has a a provision that deals with um, the, the provision of information to families. But they also have a practice note which says that um, a brief of evidence will be given to families. There's nothing similar in, um, in New South Wales. And the material that I provided this morning to the committee contains a document from Queensland which I would ask the committee to have a look at when it considers the, the rights of families and particularly this issue of provision of information to families. It's a, a, uh, an extensive document all about the way in which coroners ought to be operating in terms of dealing with families and providing them with information from an early stage. And what we've put forward in our um, submission is that families should be given information as soon as it's available, unless there are compelling reasons to um, not do so. It's recommendations 13 and 14 of our submission. 
And in my submission, there's no reason why that sort of requirement shouldn't either be in the law or, or at the least in a practice note. And there shouldn't, and there should be a similar document in New South Wales to what there is in um, Queensland, setting out quite clearly for both coroners and for families what their rights are um, throughout the process. Mr. Shibridge, the, the government's submission um, says that the the chief magistrate and the state coroner in, are in the final stages of drafting a revised practice note for guidelines for senior coron coroners for case management of deaths in custody. And apparently there's also a draft state coroner's protocol for the case manage of, management of inquests under section 23 involving First Nations people. But then it says this, the local court plans to conduct targeted consultations with key legal and First Nations stakeholders once the draft practice note and protocol are finalised. Um, that seems to me to be an odd way of consulting. You consult once you finalise documents. Um, what, 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 if anything, has been Legal Aid's involvement with this? We've been, we've been consulted in relation to both the draft protocol and the um, practice note. So just to go back some time, since about 2018, we've been agitating for there to be a practice note in relation to um, particularly First Nations or or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander deaths. Um, the state coroner has been very supportive of that. And um, when we were sitting here last year in relation to the First Nations inquiry, there was talk about a, a draft protocol then. Um, the state coroner issued what was a draft protocol earlier this year. When I say issues, it was distributed to some practitioners dealing with some of these cases. And in individual cases, we've been working to comply with that protocol. So who's been working? The, the legal representatives, importantly, the Crown Solicitor's Office, which is now being briefed in relation to all First Nations deaths. That's a very um, major development um, that's occurred. And um, it means that there's now a process where there's an early directions hearing and there um, is a lot more going on at the, the very start of, of a of the coronial process for um, First Nations Section 23 deaths. In the last six months, there's been consultations in relation to that draft pro protocol and um, also in relation to practice note three of 2021. And that practice note has now commenced. So it commenced about a week ago, the 24th of September. And so it applies to all deaths in custody and all uh, deaths in police operations. So there we're talking about 40 to 60 deaths per year that are coming into the coronial system. About um, anywhere between four and seven of them are First Nations or Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander deaths. Um, they're now, um, those First Nations deaths will be the subject of the coroner's um, protocol, which is issued under um, an earlier provision of the Act, I think it's Section 10 which or 11, which allows the coroner to issue guidelines to other coroners. Um, and there is a consultation that's going on. I'm aware of that, where the, 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 the state coroner in conjunction with DCJ is seeking to um, identify relevant Aboriginal um, community members and organisations that might provide input into that draft protocol. Mr. Sherbridge, do you have further questions? I think there's a number of other committee members, so I do more, okay. but I'll, I'll hold off. Okay, do Ms. Sharp or any other committee members have questions? Ms. Sharp, no. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Khan? If not, I might ask a, a few questions. Um, at page 10 of your submission, you strongly urge the community, Department of Communities and Justice to share with us a copy of the draft 2017 statutory review with the committee. Um, we haven't yet done that. We haven't yet requested it um, and we will do so. Um, what in particular is in that draft that you think we should turn our minds to in this review? Well, if I could... Um take that question more globally. Um, of course. Obviously, the committee is looking at whether or not there should be a new act 
and and there's a lot of strong evidence being given to the proposition that there should be a new act and a, a standalone court. Um, what the government might do to, to remedy the system is, is a different question, but um, what the draft statutory review did is looked at all of the issues that exist with the current act and the way in which they might be amended in order to, to rectify some of those issues. And there was a, a consultation that took place. Um, many stakeholders were involved, legal aid was involved, uh, and we were provided with a, a draft report in 2017, which contains a number of recommendations. They're all recommendations about amending the, the current act. And um, it wouldn't be guesswork to work out that they include some of the similar sorts of recommendations that we've made about having, for example, a preventative object or function in the act at the very start, about having um, a replica effectively of Section 8 of the, the Victorian Act, which gives guidance to people making coronial decisions about um, the impacts on families of delay, of trauma, the need for information, those sorts of things. Um, there's, there's no reason why the committee ought to be doing the hard work again that's already been done by DCJ in that statutory review to identify all of the problems that we have with the existing Act. All right. Um, your recommendation six uh, suggests that the legislation uh, should mandate that the quality of care, treatment and supervision of a person who dies in custody should be, must be investigated and formally reviewed at inquest. And do I take it that should also include the persons who die, not just in prison or police custody, but also in, in mental institutions and the like? You know, any person who's sort of like in care, as it were, in a government institution, uh, should, there should definitely be a, a, an inquest into those situations? Well, un under, under our submission, uh, in relation to the jurisdiction of the court, we've made some recommendations. I think it's at recommendation um, five in relation to the uh, scope of, of jurisdiction that exists. And um, one of those recommendations relates to section 23, that there should be some clarity that the deaths where someone is involuntary, um, in involuntary detention in a mental health uh, facility should be under section 23. So um, the short answer is if that change was made, then um, it would be uh, it would be the case that, that that person's care and treatment would also be looked at. Okay, in your submission, I think it's at page 52, you also discuss the Victorian uh, innovation of a Koori Family Engagement Unit. Um, now, there have been some steps towards this taken in the New South Wales jurisdiction. Can you tell us what your understanding is of what has happened in New South Wales to date on the uh, Aboriginal engagement front uh, and whether or not uh, it reaches the level uh, of what has been done in the equivalent jurisdiction in, in Victoria or whether there is room to improve further? Look, I think there's there's a vast room to improve further in New South Wales. We've got Aboriginal people interacting with the system all the time, and um, the the level of Aboriginal people engaged in the system is virtually negligible. Sorry, employed by the system is virtually negligible, and um, and that creates or exacerbates this this cultural divide. My understanding is, and uh, we're talking about two two major um, parts of the system, the courts and the forensic medicine service. Um, when someone dies, the first interaction that the family might have is with a forensic medicine social worker. Now, my understanding is there's never been a, an Aboriginal person employed in that role. And um, that is of concern because obviously that's the first contact and, and often one of the only contacts that family have with the system at all. Um, 
then when matters get to the court and a family might be contacting the court, it could be a regional local court and um, how many uh, Aboriginal people are employed in that court. It could be the Lidcombe Coroner's Court and my understanding is there are no registry staff that are Aboriginal working there. Um, so the changes that have happened, having identified last year the, the potential for there to be some Aboriginal employment, the changes that have happened is that two positions have been funded um, and they're funded to employ two Aboriginal people, a male and a female within the CISP service, which is the Coronial Information and Support Program. That service at the moment or has been staffed by several um, non-Aboriginal uh, counsellors who provide um, assistance when matters come to court and um, they don't provide any ongoing counselling or anything of the like. I understand what's envisaged with the new Aboriginal um, staff in CISP is that they will have an involvement from a very early stage, at the very least in all First Nations Section 23 deaths. And it's likely that that will be written into this um, First Nations protocol, which the state coroner is going to issue. But that, in my opinion, is, is really only the start. I mean, I've included um, at page 51 of our submission some information about the employment of Aboriginal people by legal aid. And I don't know why we have a system like the um, both forensic medicine and the um, and the coroner's court where there's no Aboriginal people employed and yet we can have um, over a hundred of our staff who identify as Aboriginal and, and almost seven percent of our workforce as Aboriginal. Um, I've also had some engagement with forensic medicine about this and it's part of our submission that there ought to be um, protocols that are established about um, post-mortem issues um, and the documents that I provided earlier today, if I could take you to those, they are in fact examples from Queensland of the sort of thing that we should have in New South Wales. So in Queensland, there is already a, a document produced by the court, which is the second document that I've provided to the committee, um, a document produced by the court, which, uh, which contains just pulling that up, which is a guide to cultural competency and engagement between the coroner's court and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And it goes into um, a lot of detail about who's the next of kin, about autopsy, about investigating deaths, etc. cetera. Um, there's nothing like that in New South Wales. Um, there's nothing that's been produced by forensic medicine nor by the, the state coroner's court. Um, the third document I provided is prepared by Queensland Health. Again, there's nothing from our forensic medicine service that um, goes into these sort of cultural issues. So we're a long way behind um, in terms of um, taking those steps. I, I also believe that in terms of getting access to legal services, there is a big vacuum throughout um, regional New South Wales. How does the family in Moree, when, when their son or daughter suicides, um, get access to, to medical help, I'm sorry, to, to legal assistance? And sure, some of them might contact us, but even getting the information out there that that sort of assistance is available um, is, is at the moment something that, that we struggle with due to resources. Okay. Does any other member have, a, have further questions? I, I might keep going then. Um, in relation to um, uh, your submission at page 61, you 
talk about the need for the coroner's prevention unit of the kind that exists in Victoria. Can you just uh, outline to the committee what you understand the Victorian unit does that is useful and beneficial in terms of the coronial jurisdiction? The, the context in which I've suggested the coronial prevention unit in, in the submission is in relation to recommendations. And my understanding is that in Victoria, uh, there is support provided to coroners, provided by the coroner's prevention unit, where they might be considering particular recommendations. They have research support. Um, those people will, will engage, as I understand it, with agencies to try and determine whether recommendations are appropriate. And if there's a need for follow-up, um, then the coroner's prevention unit can be involved in that. Um, so effectively, what we have in New South Wales is regional magistrates virtually running no um, inquests at all and overworked deputy state coroners and the state coroner with very little or no research support. In fact, no research support that I'm aware of who are required to um, run these large inquest matters. Um, the point about the CPU is if we want proper death prevention, then we need to resource that function so that it's done in an intelligent and a, and a, a researched way. Um, you can go to the Coroner's Court website in Victoria and look at the array of publications that have been um, prepared by the Coroner's Prevention Unit on overdose deaths, on suicides, on all manner of um, types of death which have recommendations because the findings of a single inquest really don't go anywhere. But once we start to compile that information, which is what their Coroner's Prevention Unit does, then you start to have um, force behind the, the recommendations that can be made. Okay. Um, your submission uh, also talks about the need for the coronial jurisdiction in New South Wales to better develop uh, greater cultural competency, both generally and specifically in relation to uh, First Nations uh, persons. Uh, I think in, in evidence we've received uh, from uh, Associate Professor Hugh Dillon, he, uh, he's outlined uh, how some other jurisdictions in Australia uh, do have specific focus in their legislation on First Nations people and in particular looks at the New Zealand legislation which specifically recognises uh, Maori uh, burial and other death customs. Um, what what should we do here in New South Wales to better reflect uh, the needs of one First Nations people? Oh, well, I think the the um, changes can be various. They can include amendments to the Act um, to provide recognition. They can include practical measures on the ground. So, as I've said, employment of Aboriginal people within the court system, within forensic medicine, um, better training for New South Wales police. They play a, a huge role in um, the coronial system. They investigate every one of those um, 6,000 reportable deaths. And, and they're the ones often that are primarily responsible for providing information to families. When those families are Aboriginal, is there's an issue. Um, there's an issue particularly in regional areas because there is such a level in some places of distrust or um, a history of being treated badly by the police that families are incredibly sceptical. Um, often that might lead to there not being the levels of contact that, that should exist. Um, the New South Wales Police can and do do an excellent job in some cases of staying in contact with family members, of keeping them updated. But I've also seen um, the situation where it doesn't happen at all. Or, um, and, and my concern is that with Aboriginal people, that there's a, a lot of improvement that could take place. Again, when we look at what um, publications or guidance the police have about cultural considerations and about 
the investigation of deaths. Um, we're not seeing the same sort of material that I've just shown you from Queensland, which really recognises the, the cultural, um, the things that are culturally important to Aboriginal people and sets them out for everyone to be able to, to see. I've got one last question and then I'll pass to Mr. Shoebridge, who does have some other questions. Just in relation to the often unhappy history of First Nations people in New South Wales and Australia uh, and their interactions with the police force, given that the police are the investigators for the coroner, should some consideration be given to uh, a separate coronial uh, investigations team that are not police but maybe have the same uh, powers and immunities as police in terms of doing that coronial investigation? Or is this simply something that the police service, the police force of New South Wales needs to work through with First Nations communities? My view is that there's um, a lot that could be done to improve police procedures, but that because of the, the breadth of their service throughout New South Wales, that they are in fact and, and ought to be the primary investigators for coronial matters. Um, but, but what needs to change is that there needs to be better engagement, there needs to be better processes. Um, last year when I think it was Inspector Crandell gave evidence before the, the First Nations Select Committee, he talked about perhaps the utility of there being a, a protocol for engagement with families um, that doesn't exist as far as I'm aware and, and in my view, um, a, a lot of improvement could, could take place. There are Aboriginal community liaison officers. I'm not aware at any point in time of them being utilised at least routinely in coronial investigations. So um, my view is the police are the people that ought to be investigating. The second thing to, to note about um, more complex inquests is that they they will almost always be referred to the Crown Solicitor's Office for them to assist and the investigation doesn't stop after the initial police investigation. The Crown Solicitor's Office will obtain expert reports, um, obtain other statements, um, some of that done through the police, other times it's done directly and a lot of um, investigation happens there. If there's no family legal representative, then they're the ones that are talking to the family and contacting them and providing them with information and um, and sometimes advice about the process. Mr. Shoebridge. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Evan. And I, I think obviously the Aboriginal Legal Service will bring some specific focus as well, which we should hear from in the inquiry. But um, given First Nations peoples, that the, their family history, the the historic um, um, inter interactions with the criminal justice system and the police. What's your experience of representing First Nations families and bringing them into the court environment, having the police there, having a magistrate there? Um, what what are the particular cultural cultural issues that are apparent for First Nations peoples, given their personal family and um, historic um, history with the criminal justice system? Well, I've had varying experiences. I've represented some families who have been through terrible experiences, who um, somehow are incredibly respectful of the process and are, are able to deal with the, the massive delays and the sort of um, inadequacies, inadequacies that exist. Um, but in other cases, even before we step into court, there are families that are um, outraged by what's happened. Um, and as I think I've said in, in previous evidence to the select committee last year, um, often that will come about, um, I think, because of that intergenerational trauma and um, despite the efforts of, of um, us lawyers representing families to sit down to explain things, sometimes that level of distress just does not go away. So the solution that I see is that um, we need to 
get early engagement of lawyers with families, ideally lawyers that are um, that are you know culturally competent. Um, ideally, the ALS should be staffed to deal with more than just Section Twenty Three deaths, but to be able to um, provide other coronial services or representation in other coronial matters. Legal aid. Um, Whilst we're not an Aboriginal controlled organisation, we have a large number of Aboriginal clients, um, both the Coronial Inquest Unit and Legal Aid generally. Um, sometimes Aboriginal people will come to us and say, we prefer Legal Aid. Um, so we work in partnership with the ALS and, and we're in constant or regular contact with the ALS. Um, the, so the solution is, legal representation and good representation from an early stage, um, information to families as soon as they can get it so that, so that the, the potential for, um, for um, theories about what might have happened is, is um, minimised and then less delays in the process and then um, Things which the court might do to recognise um, the, the cultural background. So, welcome to country. Um, we've given a couple of uh, examples in our cultural competency section of cases where the court has done things. Um, there's an example of, of a haka that took place, and um, I wasn't appearing in that matter, but I've spoken to those that were, and I've spoken to those that saw that, and the, the significance of that. Well, that family was huge. And Surely all of this points to taking the coroner's court out of the local court, getting it as far as away from the criminal justice system and providing a more culturally appropriate space for First Nations peoples. That would be one of the benefits, wouldn't it, for a standalone coroner's court well, moving out of the criminal justice system? I think there's huge benefit in that happening into the future that, that has to happen. Um, what we do need is is changes to this system immediately, but but obviously the the um, the long term goal would be to have a standalone court and and a new act, um, and and incorporating those factors. Um, Mr. Barnes mentioned them, but the six factors that are in the Coroner's Act in Victoria that that recognise um, different cultures, different beliefs, different practices, the impact of of coronial proceedings on families, it needs to become a more therapeutic jur juris jurisdiction where the needs of the family really are put um, at the forefront of the jurisdiction, as well as the other very important component, which is um, reducing deaths, preventing deaths by using the work of the coroner's court to change existing systems. Does any other member have any other questions? Mr. Schubert, do you have a last question? I think, I think time has beaten us, um, Chair, but I do have some questions I'll put on notice um, as supplementary if that's if that's acceptable. Of course. Um, all right, well, time for this round has now elapsed. Uh, we will take a short break and recommence at 11.40 a.m. I'd like to remind all members to mute themselves and switch off their camera during the break. And Mr. Evan and I'd like to thank you for your evidence. Um, I don't think you took any questions on notice. Uh, if, if I'm wrong and you have, the Secretariat will be in touch. Um, members may have uh, supplementary questions that they will place on notice for you and you will have up to 21 days to respond. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Otherwise, otherwise we are temporarily adjourned until 11.40. Okay, I now welcome our next witnesses uh, from uh, the New South Wales Bar Association and also from the Australian Lawyers Alliance. Uh, could each witness, starting with Ms Christina Stern, please state their name, the capacity in which they give evidence today and swear either an oath or an affirmation from the material provided by the Secretariat. Um, thank you, I'm Dr Christina Stern, Senior Counsel. Um, I'm giving evidence on behalf of the New South Wales Bar Association and I'm chair of that association's inquests and inquiries committee. Um, I will give the affirmation 
I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you, Ms Stern. Ms Edwards? Thank you. My name is Kirsten Edwards. I'm giving evidence on behalf of the New South Wales Bar Association and I'm a member of the Inquests and Inquiries Committee. I'll give the affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Dr Schetzer? Uh, I'm Dr Lewis Schetzer, the Manager of Policy and Advocacy for the Australian Lawyers Alliance, the National Manager. Uh, I am appearing today giving evidence on behalf of the Australian Lawyers Alliance and I'll um, swear the affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Ms Henry? Uh, my name is Catherine Henry. Uh, I'm a solicitor practicing in Newcastle. I'm giving evidence today uh, on behalf also of the Australian Lawyers Alliance. Um, I'm choosing to swear the affirmation. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely, truly declare and affirm that the evidence about to be given by me is the whole truth. Sorry, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms Henry. Now, would each of the uh, organisations uh, represented here for this session like to commence by making a short opening statement of no more than a, a couple of minutes? Ms Stern, for example, would you? and then Ms. Dr Schetzer. Um, yes, this is Ms Stern. Um, I would seek to make a statement on behalf of myself and Ms Edwards and on behalf of the New South Wales Bar Association. Would you like me to commence that now? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. I begin today uh, by respectfully acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this inquiry is taking place and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Uh, on behalf of the New South Wales Bar Association, we welcome the opportunity to speak today and we wish to reiterate our strong support for reform and additional resourcing of the coronial jurisdiction in New South Wales and of the establishment of a statutory specialist court. In this short opening statement, we wanted to highlight four matters from the particular perspective of the New South Wales Bar Association. First, we wanted to emphasise what we regard as a key element of the value of the coronial jurisdiction in New South Wales from a public policy perspective. And we raise this as a means of, of emphasising our overarching submission that there is a weighty public interest, not just in favour of modernising the court's structure and act but also in ensuring that the system is adequately resourced to effectively meet the many public interests it serves. In the experience of the New South Wales Bar, the Coroner's Court fulfills an invaluable role as a means of ensuring scrutiny and accountability of state agencies when their actions, omissions or processes are such that they either lead to serious risk of harm to members of the community or fail to operate to prevent such harm. The scrutiny is particularly effective because it enables the actual functioning of the agency to be investigated and explained in a way that is efficient and can have far reaching consequences in terms of introducing often much needed changes and promoting reflective and safe practices. The jurisdictional focus on death prevention in part through public scrutiny of the safety and efficacy of systems sets the coronial jurisdiction apart in our legal system. Civil litigation cases involving serious failure or wrongdoing uh, is often settled out of court, precluding any effective public scrutiny of failures and sometimes without any real accountability of those involved. It's also rare to see the conduct of public entities proceed through the criminal justice system, in part because of the high threshold for proof and also due to the focus on the individual in criminal law. It's thus almost uniquely through the coronial jurisdiction that there's an opportunity for public scrutiny of the actions and decisions of those who hold great responsibility and power in our society. Uh, in an often overlooked element of this is that in our collective experience, the knowledge that coronial scrutiny is imminent frequently leads organizations themselves to scrutinize their conduct and introduce significant reforms. It's often unlikely that such necessary changes would have been introduced or internal critiques would have occurred absent the imminence of public scrutiny by the coroner's court. 
The second matter, in our view, one issue which should be addressed as part of the consideration of this committee, and in particular of the form of the standalone specialist court that is established, is the importance of judicial independence. Given the frequency with which coroners are required to engage in scrutiny of the actions of emanations of the state, in our view, the maintenance of judicial independence and the undesirability of concern about renewal of tenure seems to us to be of critical importance. Third, we consider there's a need to sharpen and reshape how responses to recommendations made by the coroner's court are dealt with. We recommend that consideration be given to establishing a standing parliamentary committee on the compliance and adequacy of responses to recommendations by government entities. We also consider there should be a requirement that recommendations and governmental responses thereto should be published on the coroner's court website for greater transparency and public scrutiny. We also recommend the state coroner be afforded power to require any government agency to provide a response to recommendations within a fixed period of time and for the state coroner to report to parliament if no adequate response is received. Fourth, we want to highlight the need to facilitate flexible but effective procedures that enable, where appropriate, the court to offer options to meet the needs of families and communities of the deceased, whilst also ensuring that there can be effective investigation and meaningful scrutiny of involved agencies and individuals. There's a need to front load more of the coronial process so that restorative and investigative steps are taken promptly after the death even if a hearing won't take place for some time. We raise this because we well understand the devastating impact of delay on all participants in the system, but also consider that inquests conducted too soon after a death may undermine the thoroughness of investigation and scrutiny, the ability to provide procedural fairness, and to invoke the restorative and healing functions of the jurisdiction. However, we recognise the passage of time can also prejudice the ability of the process to serve its other functions. Memories dim, agencies can be less able to provide accurate exposition of the events that led to the death, and families and communities may feel unrepresented and excluded from the process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms Stone. Uh, Dr Schetzer, would you or Ms Henry like to give uh, an opening statement on behalf of the ALI? Thank you. The Australian Lawyers Alliance also welcomes the opportunity to appear before the select committees today. And uh, I also acknowledge that we are all on traditional lands of First Nations peoples, and I am coming to you today from the land of the Bidjigal people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The ALA is a national association of lawyers and academics, and we estimate that our 1,500 members nationally represent up to 200,000 people each year in Australia. The ALA is represented in every state and territory in Australia, including New South Wales, and also has a national criminal law special interest group with representation from each state and territory. In our submission to this inquiry, we canvass various issues, including the structure of the New South Wales Coroner's Court, the lack of funding and resourcing to the coroner's court in New South Wales and the consequent delays in commencing and completing coronial inquests, the capacity of the New South Wales coroner's court to examine systemic issues, and the need for greater accountability for implementing recommendations by New South Wales coroners. I'll just briefly um, touch on each of those issues. In terms of the structure of the New South Wales Coroner's Court, the ALA strongly submits that the, the Coroner's Court in New South Wales should be a standalone specialist Coroner's Court, similar to what exists in Victoria, Queensland, South Australia and Western Australia. The ALA submits that funding and resourcing of the New South Wales Coroner's Court needs to be improved in order to address delays in the coronial system. And in our submission, we referred to the um, data from the Productivity Commission's finding in 2019 that New South Wales recurrent expenditure on coronial services was $6.9 million compared to $21.5 million in Victoria and $12.4 million in Queensland. We expressed concerns regarding the significant delays in terms of progress and completion of inquests. And ALA members have encountered matters in which coronial inquests commence two or three years after the death and can take several years to, res to resolve. My colleague, 
um, Ms. Catherine Henry will be able to provide further details to the committee as to her experiences with such delays, particularly in regional areas and in the region in which she um, provides her legal representation and services. The, the ALA is concerned that these delays cause significant distress and trauma to grieving families and can detract from the quality of the evidence and can diminish the utility of any of recommendations that are made. In terms of the capacity to examine systemic issues, the ALA submits that it is essential that this capacity is further enhanced and resourced. And we agree with the New South Wales Bar Association that the court should establish a, cor a coroner's prevention unit similar to what exists in Victoria. We also support the establishment of a specialist death review team with a statutory basis to monitor and inform policy and systemic change for all deaths in custody, particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander deaths in custody. In terms of accountability for recommendations, the ALA expressed support for a number of recommendations um, from the select committee into the high level of First Nations people in custody and oversight and review of deaths in custody. We submit that there is a necessity to improve the accountability for recommendations made by the coroner, including amending the Act to ensure that relevant government departments and correctional centres respond in writing within six months of receiving a coroner's report, detailing the action being taken to implement the recommendations, or if no action is taken, the reasons why this response, uh, the reasons why, and that this response be tabled in the New South Wales Parliament. We submit that it's particularly the First Nations people who are in custody that are often um, are at greatest vulnerability and that there is a need for an active uh, oversight by the, by the coroner's court in terms of accountability for recommendations made to address deaths in custody. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr Schetzer. Um, we'll start with questions from committee members. Do any committee members have questions for these witnesses? I might kick it off. Okay, Mr. Yeah, Shivers. You go, Trevor. Yeah, no, no, you go. Um, mine's very specific. Well, now, now I'm interested. You go, Trevor. Yeah. Uh, look, I'm, <clears throat> what I'm interested in is your views on Section 63 of the Act. Um, essentially, uh, the, the interaction between uh, the, uh, the capacity to, for refusal to give evidence on the grounds of self-incrimination and the, uh, the, I suppose you could say, well, well the benefits of, of a proper ventilation of the facts in the, in the coronial proceedings. I, I, I'm thinking of this in the context particularly of deaths in custody uh, or interactions between First Nations people and uh, and the police. Well, if, if I could start off with, with that, um, Section 61 and Section 63 of the Coroner's Act is an area where the Bar Association considers there needs to be urgent reform. It's it's the section which is probably singled out by most participants as, as the most dysfunctional system because it's not fit for purpose within the coronial jurisdiction. It's mirrored on section 128 of the Evidence Act, but it plays an entirely different role in the coronial system than it does to the new, to the criminal system. Um, with, with respect to taking um, what's qualically known as taking the fifth, declining to answer on the basis of self-incrimination. There's two issues within that. The first is, is that significant delay is being caused in inquests because there's no facility within the Act to uh, allow people to give evidence in written form by way of statement with protection of a certificate. That means that uh, coroners can wait months and years to get an account from critical people involved in a matter because they're, they're seeking protection when they give evidence under oath. Um, that can lead fairly to a lot of speculation and unhappiness about why it is that that person's not, not giving that account. And, and sometimes that's based on cautious legal advice and, and doesn't just necessarily disclose the true issue. That's a matter we identify as needing significant reform and it arises frequently in police matters and also in health matters. 
Uh, secondly, there is there is the compulsion to compel an account after somebody has taken um, that objection, but there are certain consequences which flow from that in terms of not being able to use it later in criminal proceedings and, and not being able to use it in some other civil penalty proceedings. Um, that can place coroners in an invidious position in terms of, as, as you say, are we going to let the family hear what really happened and, and, and let the public have that aspect of transparency and accountability? Um, and then secondly, is the consequence of that that there will be no accountability for the particular people involved? Um, that, that's a matter which arises in, in many of those inquests and it's not, it's not susceptible to, to easy resolution. The, the practice at the coroner's court at the moment is that if there's any prospect of a criminal proceeding like a trial or, or a referral, a, a person won't be compelled to give evidence because that could eventually prejudice any steps that were taken to prosecute that particular person. So the coroners are required to make an assessment of how likely a referral is. It's really, really important that families have access to legal representation or people that can explain to them if that's going to be the case, why that's not going to happen. and. At the moment, that can be very difficult because there is inadequate access to legal representation that they may not understand that that, that that step is being taken to preserve the ability to hold someone accountable in a different forum and it can feel like a whitewash or a cover up. So with respect, it's an important area of reform. Mr Khan, do you have follow up questions? No, no, that's what I wanted to hear. Okay, Mr Shoebridge. <laughs> um, Thanks, Jane. Thanks, thanks for your um, detailed submissions to all, to all four of you. Could I ask you about um, the, the, the purposes, if we could go to the starting point, what the purposes of a modern coronial system should be and whether or not we're best to look at perhaps the way the Victorian Act is structured to, to gain the purposes for a reformed New South Wales Act or maybe Ontario or maybe New Zealand. Um, but also if you could deal with any inadequacies in the current um, act in, in, the, in that response. I might go to the Bar Association first. Um, okay, I might respond to that question. Um, it, the first aspect of the question looks to what the purposes of the system uh, are. And I think that there are obviously sort of a variety of different purposes and we've spoken to that in our submission in more detail. Um, but there is the fact-finding purpose, uh, there's the restorative and therapeutic justice purpose, um, there's also the purpose of trying to mitigate the risk of future deaths and learn from what has happened so far. Um, and there's also a sort of broader purpose which we've emphasised not so much in the headline aspect but more in the body of our submission and that is the overarching human rights purpose which one sees as reflecting um, the mainstay of the jurisdiction elsewhere, for example, in the UK, where you see a human right to investigate death, uh, underscoring the importance of investigating death. When one looks at those purposes, there are obviously a number of problems with the current system. And one of the overarching difficulties, I think, with the current act is that there is no articulation of the purposes, underscoring the steps that are taken within the colonial jurisdiction. Um, and it also means that all sorts of decisions, even in, in relation to matters like Section 61 and privilege and who should be compelled to give evidence with the benefit of a certificate, a whole range of issues, one doesn't have guiding principles which can be articulated and understood by all of those working within the system. In terms of whether that suggests that uh, a particular model uh, of coroner's court is better we certainly uh, have this, in our submission identified a preference for the Victorian model with some tweaks and balances. Um, but some of the significant advantages of that model is that it's an overarching freestanding system. Secondly, it has a clearer articulation of the purposes. But thirdly, the preventative function is more expressly articulated and reflected. And from the perspective of the Bar Association, all of those advantages uh, are things that should be given very careful consideration, we would say, by this committee in any reformed system in New South Wales. The ALA, the ALA does the ALA have a position on this? Yes, I might just um, 
briefly mention from my perspective, having practice in the coronial jurisdiction in Victoria, and then I might hand over to my colleague, uh, Ms. Henry, who has practice in New South Wales. But my experience as a, a former Victorian practitioner who um, had some experience in the coronial jurisdiction was that the importance of the Victorian um, restructuring a model was very much emphasising in the context in which it took place was the need for um, a standalone court that was also capable and adequately um, resourced to address systemic issues. Now, um, I'm always one to go back into the history lessons as well, but the restructuring of Victorian Coroners, Coroners Court followed a period during um, the 1980s and 1990s in Victoria where there was a significant number of fatal police shootings, um, particularly as occurred in a particular locality within inner Melbourne, in which I was practising at the Flemington and Kensington Community Legal Centre. And there were concerns that were raised throughout uh, the coronial inquest into a number of those shootings about the method of policing and the policing um, reliance on the use of deadly force. So that set the context in which uh, it was considered that an appropriately resourced coronial jurisdiction was necessary to address, to address some of the broader public interest and systemic issues that were at play there, that to look at broader issues such as alternative policing models that would have been relevant in, uh, in those particular inquests. So in that regard, the need for, a, for capacity to address those systemic issues was, was a strong driving factor with the Victorian reforms. Ms Henry? Um, yes, I support all that's been said in regard to um, recommendations. Uh, I just wanted to uh, speak specifically uh, on the issue of resourcing. Uh, I've seen firsthand over the course of the last three decades a general sort of diminution of hearing time and um, a, a contraction of the work done by the coroner's court and I think that's um, the, the fact if you look at the comparative funding uh, of the various states and, and the court the the coronial system in each state you can um, see that that is so um, I've al I also have the opportunity as a regional practitioner to see firsthand how uh, coronial matters are dealt with in regional areas and I think it's a, um, a major negative of the current system that in New South Wales that we have a mere five specialist coroners uh, with the bulk of the other matters uh, heard in regional New South Wales. Um, and you, you'd be aware of what's being um, played out um, in the media regarding the revelations of um, the upper house inquiry into healthcare and health resourcing in regional, rural and remote New South Wales. So um, as a regional practitioner with a practice that covers sort of the top two thirds of New South Wales, uh, I do see some pretty, some very parlous and awfully tragic cases. Uh, one in particular, um, the most recent account, the, the most recent example of um, the inadequacies of uh, from a resourcing perspective is the matter referred to at paragraph 11 of the submission of the Australian Lawyers Alliance, um, uh, the concern, an inquest concerning the death of an 18 year old boy um, who's, uh, it was only um, just over 12 months ago uh, that the parents uh, received the uh, results of the inquest. This is a boy who died in 2015 and the magistrate who was allocated the hearing of the inquest only had available to him one or two days, but generally one one day each year to allocate the way in, during which he could hear um, hear evidence in this matter. Uh, so from 2015 to 2020, uh, the family's lives were put on hold uh, while this inquest was played out. Um, I was also concerned, uh, I think it goes to the independence of uh, required, uh, the independence factors that um, Ms Stern has mentioned in any new system. Uh, we had the, the coroner, or the uh, magistrate, I should say, acting as the coroner, um, was uh, sitting in Gloucester and Foster and was hearing evidence from local ambulance services, service officers who he probably, you know, had 
may well have had existing relationships with um, and um, and you know the, the family just didn't see that there was any degree of independence. Ms. Henry, Ms. Henry, can you speak to the experience? Justice. Can you speak to the experience of a family in, in a case like that? They've had the death of their their boy, their eighteen year old boy, and the grief and the trauma associated with that, and wanting to know why. But then being brought back once a year, mm. a day in court. Yes, that well, on the face of it sounds very re traumatizing. It was re traumatizing and um, spending a lot of time with these, with the with the members of the family, the the mother, um, who you know has um, had the most awful uh, time without going into her reaction, but um, you know she her she has had a very um, you know a, a shocking and a, um, a response to what happened to her husband, sorry to her son's uh, untimely and avoidable death. Um, but yes, to have have the circumstances of his death um, you know, brought to bear, um, you know, just once one day each year, one one day each year was, um, as you say, did re-traumatise. Um, much has been said about the. Sorry, can I, can I just ask a question here? If I go to paragraph eleven, Ms. Henry, of your of, of the submission, mm. now, it doesn't explain the the gap in between. But it seems to me that what's being suggested is there was there was two day hearings in 2018. The matter was then adjourned, and there's two day hearing. There's a two day, further two day hearing in the following year. Now I'm not. Mm. I, I'm concerned that there is a 12 month delay, and that mm. I hear what you say. But it seems that there was a block of time of more than one day in those two years. Sorry, yes, well, we had to really push for that. And there was a, there was, and this has been my experience that the- Well, um, I've practiced in local, in local courts in country areas. So I've got some idea of the difficulty of getting time allocated, but your evidence is one day a year. The submission talks in both of those years has been two days. Now, yes. There's not an explanation as to the gap, but your evidence is different from the submission. That's the only only question. Oh, I, well, I yes, but I you know, there was all the way through the inquest, there was a pressure to truncate the proceedings, and it was just uh, over. Yes, it did spill into the second day, but the magistrate and there was, I should say, a, a, one of the uh, one of the reasons or a factor was that council assisting uh, originally initially allocated to the uh, to the matter. Um, died and a new council assisting had to, had to be appointed, um, but the the point is that um, you know it was a five year period. Whether it was one day, two days, I mean, really, there was a lot more that could have been said at the inquest um, than was. Uh, Ms. Henry, just on just on that, Miss Henry, sorry to interrupt, but is it generally your experience that there are, you know, leaving aside the details of any particular case, that there is systemic delays? Often in the in, in a number of years in having uh, findings in coronial inquiries made by coroners. Uh, yes, that's my experience. Um, uh, not always, but often. And um, yes. and uh, in this particular case, like the um, the uh, members of the upper house inquiry will no doubt remember the um, the case of um, Magistrate Dominic Burns and the. Uh, evidence given before that inquiry, or I'm sorry, didn't actually reach an inquiry, but there was much made in the media about the crushing workload of um, local court magistrate Dominic Burns, and it has, and the point has been made elsewhere that um, magistrates do have um, an inordinately high workload, and, um, and and that's a separate issue. But it does come into the, it does come into and have relevance on this particular inquiry because it is the magistrates who have to try to find a day, um, two days, um, any time um, in the midst of this crushing workload, in the midst of hearing, you know, a, a great pile. I've, I've been a local court solicitor too. I've also been a local court prosecutor. You have a, a massive list of matters, AVOs, um, drink driving offences, um, hearings, Magistrate Burns um, 
it, it appears had a, an inordinately high, she was in a, an inexperienced magistrate, she was sitting up there on her own. And somewhere, somehow, and, and to imagine how a magistrate like her would have the capacity uh, to, um, to manage uh, an inquest in the, in the middle of her, um, in the middle of her list uh, is, is it just- Ms. Henry, I, I think- Fanciful, fanciful. I might just ask, um, and I think it's useful to ask the Bar Association, um, have you noticed the same concerns and is there more delay? Is it more difficult in regional New South Wales than in the city? Have you noticed these same concerns? Well, and just in answering that, um, Ms. Edwards and Ms. Stern, I think at page 36 of your of the Bar Association submission, you provide some very compelling statistics about the level of delays in coronial findings, even where there are inquests. So if you could focus on that as well, please. I'll, 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 you're, start. You're mute. Okay. I'll start with that. The, the case is that there's delays in both aspects of the system. There's, there's delay in inquests that occur out of Lidcombe and there's delay in, in regional inquests. The, the New South Wales Bar Association strongly supports a centralised system so that all deaths are being reported to a centralised system so that they can be assessed and, and triaged and themes can be um, identified as emerging. The difficulty with a two-tier system is that a great number of important deaths in the regions may go unnoticed, for example, in a particular hospital or with a particular area because they're not coming to the attention of the state coroner unless someone is bringing it to her attention. So there's, there's that aspect as well. It, it's undoubtedly the case that there is um, that the workloads of, of all magistrates in New South Wales make it impossible for them to manage a coronial workload or in, in any way similar to what is being done um, through senior coroners. Um, having said that, we think it's important to make clear that senior coroners regularly travel to regions and do inquests that are emanating from the regions and the bar strongly supports that continuing. So it, a centralised system doesn't mean that inquests are being taken away from the regions. We, we consider that there should be an overt preference that any death which occurs in the region should be held in that locality. And, and that is something which greatly benefits the therapeutic aspect because it's something that the families almost always strongly support. In, in terms of the causes of delay, both in the regions and, and centrally, we, we wanted to highlight that it's a multifaceted um, thing. It's, it's easy to say it's, it's inadequate resourcing, but it, it operates at a number of levels. And we also wanted to make clear it's certainly not because of a lack of diligence or work ethic in any of the coroners, including any of the regional coroners, some of whom I've worked with, or the solicitors at the Department of Community and Justice or the Crown Solicitor's Office. There's a lot of weekend work and there's a lot of night work with those organisations. But we have police putting together briefs with a great variety of experience and that can take a very long time. There are significant delays in the Department of Forensic Medicine with releasing autopsy reports and that causes delay. A brief, when it arrives, needs to be assessed by somebody and then depending on the quality of the brief, some homicide briefs, for example, are exceptionally well prepared. Some briefs are put together by a constable in their first six months of practice and they can't possibly be expected to have the skill and they have no specific training in these matters to do it well. So it might be that the first brief has to be almost reinvented again with a series of requisitions and that will again potentially add six months, one year to the process. We then have the resources of the DCJ and the CSO declining, which means those solicitors, if they're involved in those matters, they have to be reviewed for their appropriateness, but then they also have to be taken on and people with carriage. And we focus more on those complex matters because that's where we tend to be briefed. So there are delays in, in that process as, as well. And then government departments are being faced with a large amount of what we call requisitions, requests for information, requests for statements. They don't necessarily have specific resources allocated to res responding to, res to requests from the coroner. We find that almost inevitably deadlines that are set by the coroners go, go begging without any, any real recourse. And an, another aspect of the Act is that coroners don't have the power to really compel people to produce. They can ask by a certain date, but there's no costs or any other mechanism for them to enforce that. 
Um, there's also an aspect of medical statements and how medical statements are collected by lawyers or whether they should be done by medical organisations, which causes delay. And then there's an aspect of review by way of non-publication order and public interest immunity claims, which in our experience are increasing and are causing significant delays in that regard. And then finally, when we get to the hearing, there's there's a shortage of coroners both in Lidcombe and in the regions that have any court time. And as Ms Henry said, in, in the local court, a local court magistrate might have at best one day out of a six month period. And, and the particular inquest may be one that, that no possible justice can be given to that inquest within that period of time. So we wanted to draw attention to that multifaceted aspect of delay because it's from so many different areas and it's not just resourcing one area, but multiple areas. I don't know. Look, th thank you for that. I I've got some questions for the Bar Association based on its submissions. At page 20, you talk about the need to have First Nations persons involved to a greater degree in the coronial jurisdiction, not just uh, in operational levels, but in positions of power. And you have two instances. You, you talk about the need for First Nations coroners to be appointed as a matter of urgency, and also to have perhaps First Nations commissioners, perhaps assisting coroners on relevant uh, death inquiries. Um, in relation to the first proposition about First Nations coroners, I shouldn't have to ask this, but uh, given your knowledge of the state of the bar, are there, are there a number of sufficiently experienced uh, practitioners who could be appointed uh, as First Nations coroners should the government decide to make this a priority? Um, I can certainly say that there are some and you know, yep. the first person that comes to mind is uh, Senior Counsel Tony McAvoy who's the chair of our First Nations committee and, and he could assume the role almost instantly because of his skill and experience. There are yes. other senior um, First Nations lawyers at the New South Wales Bar. Whether they're interested and have the requisite experience, I would have to sure. take that question on notice. But we we put forward that submission in consultation with our First Nations committee, and we're certainly happy to enhance it with their input. But it's not necessarily the case that we we anticipated that all of those First Nations representatives would necessarily be barristers or magistrates. We, we see mm -hmm a role for First Nations people sitting um, in court where they may not be conventionally legally trained. Um, and particularly there may be a role for somebody, um, a First Nations person, who, to sit aside a senior coroner, for example, in a death in custody matter. The senior coroner would have that legal training and experience, but they would be sitting alongside and providing what we consider to be a really essential perspective and also having genuine input into how that hearing progresses. So there's there's multiple ways in which we see that that could be achieved. Okay. At page 42, you talk about uh, in 2020, coroners made recommendations to a number of non-government bodies uh, in terms of recommendations being made. Um, are there legislative impediments to magistrates actually requiring non-government persons and bodies to respond to coronial recommendations? And if there are should some enhancement be given to compel non-government actors to have to respond to coronial recommendations? Well, I mean, right now the coroners don't have any power to compel anybody to respond to coronial recommendations, either state agencies or private entities. Um, so yes, th there does need to be legislative attention to how that is done. And I should say that that has to go hand in hand with some sort of policy support for the coroners to have the ability to identify that these things aren't happening or have some sort of longitudinal perspective as to how many- Like a tracking mechanism. Yes, yes, um, we, we support that. Um, government private entities um, are much less likely to be recurrent players within the system. So while that's important, it's not necessarily as urgent as government agencies. Having said that, there are some notable exceptions, private prisons being the most obvious notable exception or any private care facility that, that deals with either children or elderly people or things of that nature. They, to some extent, can be considered to be as important in terms of state agencies. But we, we consider that that needs to be done hand in hand with 
a policy framework for the coroner's court where the coroners have support to understand death prevention and themes and what has happened over a period of time and then having the legislative power to follow up and to ask people and hold people to account as to what's being done and what hasn't been done and we also as as dr stern indicated see a role for parliament in that area as well and just knowing that that oversight is occurring we consider could be of great assistance in um, facilitating better compliance and faster compliance and, and to that uh, something like the victorian coroner's prevention unit is providing research and analysis of coronial data to better assist coroners to make you know well thought through recommendations would also be of assistance i take that would be your view um can i cut in there Dr. Stern, please um Yes, and I think that's another key aspect of what we see as one of the problems with recommendations, um, and that is that they're not publicly available, readily collated, um, and easy to research. So uh, it, it does seem to us that that sort of um, prevent death prevention unit or something of that nature would be so helpful because when you're working within the jurisdiction, um, you come up against problems all the time where you're trying to work out what recommendations have been made on this particular subject in the past and what, whether they've been acted on. And there's also a sense of a lack of accountability when no one's been really publicly um, uh, made to say what's happened, when and you know what time frame it was acted upon. So it seems to us that that aspect is so important um, for every aspect of the jurisdiction. Uh, and we've had evidence that not all coroner's findings are actually published. So presumably your view would be they should all be published and they should all be easily locatable. Um, yes, but there's a particular issue with recommendations because they'll be at the end of, a, of findings. And so often we have to rely upon sort of asking people who work in the jurisdiction to just say, look, if you've done a case in this area, then you find the name of the case, then you find the findings, and then you find the recommendations. And that's just a ridiculous system when you're looking at a death preventative function. So it's not just that they're not all published, it's that even if they are published, it's not always easy to find the recommendations and it just shouldn't be that time consuming and opaque. Okay, my last question is this, page 46 you set out, I think the, the many desirable aspects of the Victorian model. Um, one of the aspects of the Victorian model is though that their coroners are only appointed for five years. They're renewable, but they don't have judicial independence. I take it the bar's traditional view would be in favour of judicial independence? Um, yeah, our view is very much in favour of judicial independence. And we appreciate that there's a tension between judicial independence and having um, forms of sort of fixed period appointments. Uh, the other sort of tension is that if you're a judicial officer, um, questions of misconduct, et cetera, have to go through very high thresholds and the Judicial Commission procedure. And that is another aspect of uh, reform that we think needs to be given express consideration to. But we're very concerned about judicial independence in the context where coroners are scrutinising the actions of governmental agencies day in, day out. Okay. And at page 48, you outline what a reform model in New South Wales might look like. but. Uh, one of the things that's not teased out is if we were to have, for example, a separate coroner's court, as in Victoria, should there remain a nexus with another court, i.e. should every coroner appointed also be uh, a magistrate, uh, so they've got somewhere maybe to go back to when their term comes up if they're only going to have limited term appointments, or should it just be like other specialist jurisdictions, you should just you know, be appointed to that body and and, and have a general term of appointment until retirement? Um, certainly from the Bar Association, we quite carefully didn't take a fixed position as to which model of a specialist court. Uh, it, we see the sort of the advantages of an entirely independent court um, as being much greater control, flexibility. You don't have to appoint people from the local court, which can have advantages if you're trying to appoint people from different backgrounds. Um, and it's more amenable to an integrated system, which would cover all aspects of the jurisdiction. Um, as against that, we think there are advantages of what we often call the children's court model, 
which I think will probably be familiar to the committee. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that there remains the system of judicial independence and the protection of the Judicial Commission and the high thresholds. Uh, it also enables an interaction in terms of resourcing between uh, the local court and the specialist court. Um, and it also enables the court to have access to the longer term expertise of uh, judicial officers. So uh, certainly the Bar Association's position is that there are pros and cons both ways. Um, okay. And I just want to add in terms of the regional inquest, um, when you conduct them, the advantage of cooperation and the accesses of the local court are very real. Although that's not to say that that couldn't be arranged even in an entirely independent standalone court. Okay. I just um, add one comment to, to the question as okay. well, is that um, one would have to be very cautious that in resourcing the coroner's jurisdiction with the appointment of, of judicial um, figures, and, and um, enabling them to be part of the judiciary, that you're not then draining resources from the local court as well, and then basically shifting the resource problem down to, a, um, down to the local court as well. So there would be, uh, it, it needs to be a, um, an additional um, injection of resourcing for coroners that doesn't come at the cost of magistrates in the local court as well. Okay. And can um, I just can I just make a further point that goes to you know bricks and mortar accommodation type concerns? Um, a lot of um, in Newcastle, for example, we had a a, um, a purpose built new uh, uh, court complex built about uh, five seven years ago. Um, a lot of if you walk into that court any day of the week, um, you'll see a lot of um, there there might be two out of eight courts being utilised. So I wouldn't want members of the committee to think that um, that um, the judicial resourcing um, equates to establishment of new brick complexes to accommodate a, a specialist court. Because I, I mean, I, um, I don't think that's right. I don't, okay. I don't think that's the case. I think time for this session has technically elapsed. Do any committee members have a last question? Um, all right. Well, I'd like to thank to thank the witnesses for their their uh, evidence. Uh, it's been very uh, useful. If any questions have been taken on notice, and I don't don't think they have, but if they have, the secretariat will contact you in relation to those questions. Uh, committee members may have additional questions which they will put uh, on notice to you, and you'll have uh, 21 days uh, to respond. Uh, that's uh, that's the usual process. Uh, and so I'd just like to thank Dr. Stern and Ms. Edwards and uh, Ms. Henry and Dr. Schetzer for, for your time this morning. Thank you very much. It's been very, very illuminating and useful, at least just for my own part. So I think we're going to uh, have a break now until uh, 10 past one, more or less keeping to our schedule. All right. Well, I think we are live and we can now commence the final round uh, of uh, hearing for today. I welcome our final panel of witnesses. Uh, could each witness please state their name, uh, the capacity in which they give evidence today, and swear either an oath or affirmation from the material provided to you by the Secretariat. And we'll start with Mr Craig Longman. Mr. Longman, I think we you're on mute. Okay, hopefully that will be my mistake for the day. Yep. <laughs> uh, my name is Craig Longman. I'm the head of legal strategies and a senior researcher at Jambana Indigenous House of Learning. I'll take an oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Uh, Ms. Whitaker. I'm a Gomorrah woman uh, coming to you in the capacity of my work as a senior researcher at the John Bunner Institute, and I'll take an affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
thank you. Uh, Dr Bray? Hello, my name is Rebecca Scott Bray. I'm giving evidence in my capacity as a researcher and teacher at the University of Sydney. I'll take the affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And Professor Williams. Thank you. I'm Megan Williams. I'm Wiradjuri and I'm coming to you today as a Professor of Indigenous Health and Head of the Giribar Indigenous Health Discipline at UTS. I'll make an affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, thank you. Um, now, would uh, any of the witnesses like to give a brief uh, opening statement? Uh, I guess we, we traditionally take an opening statement from each body or group. So, uh, Jambana, you could give one opening statement and the two uh, academics could give their own, I guess, because they're appearing in different capacities. So, does someone like to give a, an opening statement on behalf of Jambana of just a couple of minutes? I'll be giving the opening statement on behalf of Jumban. Thank you, Ms. Whittaker. Thank you. I'm on Garagula Mongol country today, and I want to take the chance to acknowledge their elders and ancestors and their continuing sovereignty. In speaking to you today, Craig Longman and I represent the work of the Jumbana Institute, an Indigenous led research unit at the University of Technology, Sydney. On behalf of our colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to submit on a long overdue review of the coroner's court. We hope this is an opportunity for an institutional level reform on a court that causes great harm to Indigenous families, but that also has the potential, recognised by the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, to offer them justice. We walk beside families through the coroner's court after their loved ones have died in custody. We see these courts diminish their hopes for justice for their loved ones, sideline them from critical procedures in which there should be central stakeholders and alienate them in the day-to-day -day of an inquest, at times degrading them and the memory of their loved one, and leaving them drained of resources, well-being, and a path forward for justice. They come to the coroner's court to address the wound that a carceral system has given them, and then they leave with a new wound, one made by the inquest itself. The way that coroner's courts encounter surviving First Nations families is not only a cultural competency issue, Although we agree with Professor Williams that this is also a matter requiring urgent redress. These are fundamental design problems in the coroner's court that presently make the court inadequate for addressing First Nations deaths in custody. And that inadequacy has had grave consequences for our community. Families approach these courts seeking justice and find themselves managed instead of brought in as full and involved participants in a judicial process. They seek to point out to coroners the racism, the colonialism, and the discriminatory systems that came to bear on their loved one, and are met by procedures that see their role as sentimental or ceremonial rather than substantive. These inquests instead prioritize the substantive rights of other interested parties, of which there are many, most funded by the state itself, in a context of growing adversarialism. Those parties routinely work side by side and appear before the coroner over years, developing a shared language, assumptions and trust that a family who only appears once at an inquest in their lives could never hope to influence. The inquest itself is informed by the investigations of police rather than independent investigators. Its scope is conceived narrowly, focusing so intently on the person who has died and a biomedical model for their death that it fails to see the actors and systems that took them. Families are asked to wait years, in recent cases up to five, for answers that because of memories being lost to time, now will never come. The inquest is often naive to race and colonization, except to accommodate small cultural practices in its procedures, and to sometimes cast First Nations communities as deficient and implicate them in deaths in custody. These inquests are not transparent. There's no central repository of non-publication orders and no findings are systematically digitized until 2012. Referrals made to prosecutors are not done on the record 
unlike in other states and territories. And like the provision of Section 61 certificates offering protection from liability for witnesses, they come with strict publication restrictions. Families seeking to publicly share materials revealed to the court, like CCTV footage or the names of officers involved in proceedings, face nearly insurmountable barriers in doing so. There is no systematic body of funding to support them in doing this work, except for the efforts of our community, community controlled organizations and supporters, families would be nearly alone in this experience. These are questions of substantive justice, fundamental to the design of the court itself, not the procedural cultural accommodations that, while crucial, are only a small part of the picture. The coroner's court, it is now submission, must open up to the First Nations community and surviving families to hear from them on independent specialist practices and procedures for First Nations deaths and deaths in custody. These must then be enshrined in statute as a distinct part of the Coroner's Act based on what this consultation process has been told. And there must be significant resources made available to make good on these commitments to the community. And that is what is required if inquests are ever to be just for First Nations. Thank you, Ms. Whittaker. Uh, Dr. Bray and Professor Williams, do each of you Want to give a brief opening statement? Okay, we'll start with Dr. Bray. Great, thank you. I, I'll just clarify it's Scott Bray. I apologise, Scott Bray. It's no big deal. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to identify myself to the committee, to the panel, and others watching. I'm a settler on the unceded lands of the Wongal people. I live and work on Wongal and Gadigal land, and I acknowledge the Wongal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and their traditional custodianship and continuing care of country. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge their sovereign connection to this land. This was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the select committee. Um, I firstly want to uh, refer to the questions of costs that repeatedly come up when we talk about either questions of resourcing the jurisdiction or reforms to the jurisdiction. So coronal death investigation, including, but not restricted to the holding of inquests is a considerable and necessary justice investment. New South Wales, as has been revealed in the earlier sessions today and in many submissions, spends less on coronal death investigation and other comparable jurisdictions. However, any outlining of costs must take account of the other primary costs to the community. The cost is acutely felt in other areas, missed work due to illness and bereavement, delays which compound trauma and pain and echo for years in the lives of families. People who have lost loved ones often report they do not wish other families to suffer the loss and the costs of losing a loved one in similar circumstances. And really it's important to note that it is the bereaved ultimately who are left to embrace the benefits or bear the failings of the coronial system. Negative experiences in the coronial jurisdiction compound community trauma and pain. And this means that there is a lot at stake, including in this inquiry. Facets of death investigation seemingly so endemic in Australia, such as inquest delays, disrupt the capacity of coroners to exercise a therapeutic jurisdiction. The ethos of therapeutic jurisprudence cannot operate in an under-resourced system. Compassion is not embodied solely in the demeanour of coroners or their careful attention to the truth to the bereaved who come before their court for answers. It is also brought to bear in the daily work of death investigation, from forensic medical processes through to months of communication, disclosures, timing and conduct of inquests, finalisation and investigation. When one issue, one, such as delays in inquests, can disappear, the other good work that coroners can do. It's important to note that coroners do not work alone. The system involves many people, Forensic medical staff, registrars, lawyers, advocates, witnesses, support people, and of course, families and their communities. This is reflected in courtrooms which bring people together before the coroner who presides over often adversarial proceedings. The operation and logistics of the act and the law are one thing, but the practice of coronership and interrelated professionals is another. And this is to say nothing about the conduct outside of courtrooms, in bathrooms, cafes, or corridors. The issues requiring attention by this inquiry are manifold. Questions of overarching principles, processes and practices, from notification of death through to post-finding conduct, 
whereby the bereaved's desire for truth, their demands for accountability and their need for acknowledgement are recognised and respected. The status and recognition of the bereaved, such as via a charter for the bereaved, for example, which clearly outlines expectations and rights and increased attention to the place and status of family and community engagement at inquests, such as via statements. What about appropriate counselling and support? There's the question of supporting the work of coroners via research that is not just epidemiological in nature. There are significant questions about the place of open justice, including how the Office of the Coroner interfaces with broader publics, such as researchers and journalists, its internet presence and the availability of resources, findings and recommendations. The challenge for many coronial jurisdictions, including New South Wales, lies in realising the preventative potential of coronial practice via the issuing of recommendations. There has been limited research into the effect and impact of coronial recommendations, but what the research does highlight is the complexity and diversity of issues involved in the formulation, expression and implementation of coronial recommendations and responses to them, including oversight mechanisms, Examining the characteristics of coronial findings and recommendations and organisational responses is an important step to understanding the coronial role and its contribution to prevention, which is supposed to be a guiding attribute of the modern jurisdiction. Crucially and instructively, we do not know when, whether and to what extent coroner's investigations precipitate action, when recommendations are made, accepted and acted on, or why they are rejected. Analysing the circuit between coronal investigations, recommendations and relevant agencies is essential in establishing current limitations and best practices. Research is imperative to examine the intersection of coronial work and reform to document death prevention. Without this information, the effectiveness or suitability of the coroner as an agent of death prevention cannot be fully ascertained. Families and communities pain does not end at the completion of an investigation or an inquest. As the written evidence of families to this inquiry and written and oral evidence to other inquiries demonstrates, the death of a loved one, someone loved and missed, irrevocably changes the lives of those left to grieve them. The work of grief and mourning goes on, it never ends. The end of the coronial process is not it for families. Many families express that they have had to do the labour to follow up where the recommendations have been acted upon. As a society, we owe it to them to ensure that a core part of the coronial process, recommendations, those very things that are intended to represent the preventative potential of the modern jurisdiction, are received, acted upon, followed up, monitored, and that all of that is recorded. Respectfully, I submit that as its priority, the Select Committee listens closely the experiences and views of those directly affected by coronial process and practice. Families and their communities possess authoritative knowledge about the numerous issues the inquiry is concerned with and speak to what is at stake in its outcomes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Professor Williams? around greetings all as Wiradjuri acknowledge that I come from the land of the Gadigal today and I pay my respects to their ancestors and spirits of this land and their elders of the past and present. I acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this inquiry. As well as speaking from a Wiradjuri family perspective of the coronial process, I speak from 25 years experience as a public health professional having focused on better evidence about the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the criminal justice system. I'm a chief investigator of a national palliative care in prisons project. And I tend to focus on questions about increasing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforces and also the use of our evidence in system design. Some of the discussion earlier today risks problematizing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as hard to engage, distrusting, having complex problems and needing unique fixes that are somehow other to Australian systems. But there is an alternative and a leadership view and I urge you to take it. And that view is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have highly developed expertise in health and social care, policy development, research, system design, we know the way forward and it's our cultural responsibility to be leaders and of leaders of this country 
and we're skilled in being able to do that. From evaluative data evidence perspective too, Aboriginal people do much better at looking after the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we've got evidence of that in the legal and health um, systems. And we have a large workforce that's able to do that, that it currently exists. And there is that simple phrase that if you get it right for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you'll get it right for everyone. But in my role, say at the National Centre for Cultural Competence and in collaborative research, I'm constantly told by non-Indigenous people, I'm scared of saying or doing the wrong thing. And that includes my experience in the coronial process. But even if non-Indigenous staff are confident, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have the right to and need to be leading decisions, including about how material in the cultural in the coronial process is interpreted from causes of deaths to the gathering of evidence and processes for family care. In terms of the non-Indigenous workforce, there are guidelines in the professions associated with issues relevant to the coronial process, such as health and any employee of New South Wales government that mean that conduct should already be informed, culturally safe, culturally responsive, whatever the phrase people choose to use, as well as informed by leadership of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Aboriginal people's perspectives, as well as in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled organisations. So we already have that written in current documents. My submission to this inquiry outlines some of those expectations, including through the Aboriginal Health Plan, for example, but non-Indigenous colleagues I'm among say that they have, they don't meet the, um, the visions of this plan. They don't have funds for cultural safety frameworks, plans or actions, and so can't operate in accordance with New South Wales government's own existing directives for its staff. This also erodes the right of Indigenous people to self-determine. And in my experience, if non-Indigenous staff are fearful and underdeveloped in their capacity to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or cultural processes, they retain power and norms in a way that excludes us. So plans and questions have to be asked about the way forward that includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership. Partly, needs to happen because we are overrepresented in New South Wales with poorest health and wellbeing, some of the highest mortality rates, as well as numbers in prisons and numbers of deaths in prisons that, um, that need to be responded to. And I can hear you thinking, and we've heard today, we don't have enough Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce like lawyers, but it is about looking to where we do have existing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce, such as our community controlled health services. In my view, it's a real shortcoming that the coronial process and criminal justice system doesn't use these services. They are underfunded and yes, we must not burden these services with more work, thinking that we're making progress by inviting them to be part of the process. We must find new funding mechanisms that overcome the Commonwealth state jurisdictional divide that drives the exclusion of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health organisations from state business such as coronial processes. If we find new mechanisms, we will tap into a large existing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce that we can plan to become a skilled workforce for coronial processes into the future. The other part of this issue that's important for me to raise is that universities do have aims to improve curriculum that includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's knowledges so that all lawyers, for example, of the future will be able to be more attuned. But universities generally don't meet Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff numbers. So progress on this is slow. It will be some time before we're able to have a mainstream workforce or an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce. 
to meet the needs of the coronial process. That's why partnerships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health organisations could be one solution important to consider. And they will have some independence as well. And for example, there are social and emotional wellbeing workers within these organisations. We've heard many times that families need more support and this could be one potential way, but an actual plan for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce and workforce for the coronial process is essential, as is a plan for the non-Indigenous workforce that, and their current capacity to engage respectfully and in accordance with our rights to self-determine as Indigenous peoples. Thank you for the opportunity to make those statements. Thank you, Professor, and thank you all for your opening statements. Uh, we'll commence uh, with questions from uh, Mr. Shoebridge. Look, thank you all for your submissions and not just your submissions in your time today, but your ongoing work in this space. Um, Professor Williams, um, it's, it's hard to know where to start with your raft of really carefully crafted recommendations, but could I start with Aboriginal controlled community health organisations? Um, uh, how do you see them being integrated into the coronial system? Um, do you see them as being a, a, a conduit between the coronial system and Aboriginal community, um, Abri the Aboriginal community by reason of them being trusted and on the ground and knowledge? Or do you see them also as having an institutional role within the court? And if so, what would that be? I think an institutional role is possible. We do have a long experience working in partnership and making shared agreements and those agreements can be made, as have been made culturally for tens of thousands of generations, can be made between the institutions um, that participate in the coronial process. For example, Justice Health, a community controlled health organisation and the, the coroner. Um, so it's a matter of making um, clear terms of reference, but also funding those too. Well, we've seen this state federal divide exposed in terms of funding in the current pandemic crisis with Aboriginal community controlled health organisations excluded from most of the state responses and being seen as an exclusive federal um, um, resource. Um, do you think we have lessons to learn from this? I do. A absolutely. That's just a decision that's made by humans to fund and arrange affair, Indigenous health affairs in that way, and there's no reason it cannot be changed. We need to boost New South Wales' own capacities for engaging respectfully with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Our ATCHOs, the acronym Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, our ATCHOs have evidence of doing it well. Our New South Wales state government has many challenges they've identified. Partnerships between New South Wales Health and ATCHOs are to occur on paper because of the national, the Aboriginal Health Plan, but they're not resourced. There's no implementation plan. So yes, we need the more funding at the Commonwealth level for ATCHOs and say the use of Medicare for inreach for people, say in my field, people who are have a life limiting illness in prison and are expected to die, why can Medicare not be used to support the family and the individual that way, as well as a different funding mechanism by the state to ensure ATCHOs can support and have an institutional role in the coronial process in New South Wales. It's not an either or, it's a both and funding mechanism change required. But some of the institutional resistance to have, from a state government perspective, to having ATCHOs at the table seems to come from a fear that they'll be responsible for um, a proportion of funding um, and, and this, you know, historical concept that that's all federal business. Um, did, would, would statutory reform in this regard be helpful, giving ATCHOs a statutory role in the coronial court? to, if you like, force the hand? 
a statutory role would be helpful and should be seriously considered. But we also need New South Wales government to take responsibility for the fact that it currently does not meet burden of health and illness and does not currently meet its own requirements that it has set out on paper to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in a way that we have the right to do. So we all we need attention to both those at the state level. Can I ask all the witnesses, um, um, the, the, the local court and the coroner's court, according to the government's submission, have been going through the process of a revised practice note for senior coroners, coroners for case management of deaths in custody, together with a state coroner's protocol for the case management of section 23 inquests involving First Nations deaths. What has been their outreach to you and how do you have any views about the process that's been used to develop those protocols and, and practice notes? I might start with you, Ms. Whitaker. I actually think my colleague Craig might be a better place to talk about this. Yes, thank you. Um, there hasn't been, uh, as far as I'm aware, well, certainly I haven't seen a coronial protocol in relation to First Nation deaths in custody. I am aware of it because of the work that we do with allied organisations. My understanding is that it has been, um, the consultation has been with certain stakeholders that haven't included, for example, many of the families that gave evidence to this, to the inquiry in uh, last year. Uh, it hasn't included consultation with some of the Indigenous support workers who regularly work with those families. Um, it hasn't included consultation with at least some of the lawyers who've represented families whose matters have highlighted particularly concerning systemic problems in the coronial jurisdiction. Um, I don't say that to be critical, not being in the tent, so to speak. I don't know what the plan is, but I do think it's important to make this observation. I read in the New South Wales government's submission that those steps have been taken and I heard the evidence given by Mr. Evenden earlier today. It's concerning to me that the manner in which this was done appears to be effectively that the lawyers in the court crafted a document that they then shared with other lawyers who work in the court with some feedback from families that, that through the, the lawyers, clients of those lawyers, that they then intend to um, consolidate and share with stakeholders. And I understand, of course, that is how traditionally courts often seek to reform or improve their, their um, roles. It's, it's a common institutional process, that idea of a practice note. But I think it speaks to a central problem and it goes to highlight something that Professor Williams said earlier, is that what we have heard time and again from families, I think makes clear to this committee that business as usual will not work. It will not fix the fundamental problem with the coronial system. And I think the first question that needs to be asked, and it's um, it's raised in Professor Dillon's submissions is really what is the purpose of this system? And a lot of the tinkering, if I um, don't, don't intend that to be derogatory because I understand even small changes can require a lot of political effort and, and will. And um, I also wanna single out the efforts that have been made by the current state coroner um, to improve this system. And there have been some improvements, but what is the purpose? And the purpose, um, from our view at least, needs to start with a proper consultation with First Nations communities about what is truth seeking and what is um, justice in the context of a First Nations death in custody. Because until you know that answer, you're attempting to reform a system without truly understanding what the goal is. Yeah, just on that point, uh, I draw your attention and I'm happy for you to take this on notice. Um, Appendix C to the Bar Association submission, uh, submission 17 to this inquiry, is a copy of the State Coroner's Draft Protocol for Case Management of Mandatory Inquests involving 
deaths of First Nations people. It's dated March of this year by, and has the name of the current state coroner. Um, I'll, I'll get the Secretariat to send that to you, but perhaps on notice you could give us your views on that draft protocol, um, just to, so we've got your insight into a step that the coroner's court has taken or is apparently taking uh, in this important direction, but its adequacy or, or you know your your insight into that would I think be useful for us. I'm very happy to take that on notice. I can say one thing that I think arises from the submissions from families that have been made to the previous inquiry and this inquiry, and I would I think would be agreed by many of the practitioners who represent them is that um, the often there are common issues between inquests that are either in custody or not in custody. So, for example, one of the things many um, families say to us, and the, the family of Aunt, Auntie Tanya Day said this, and it's extracted in our first submission from last year, is I need you to understand the same system that killed my uncle killed my mum. I need you to understand this. It's that issue of systemic issues. And I think one of um, I, don't, I don't think I can add anything more to what I previously yeah. said, and I don't want to take other people's time. Dr. Scott Bray or Professor um, Williams, do you have a response to that that question I had about the development of these protocols and and case practice notes? Practice notes, Dr. Scott Bray. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I've, I've not been consulted. I'm a, a coronial researcher, but I don't necessarily think that that's um, important in um, this circumstance. But yeah, I would have thought that, um, especially given the issues raised in terms of the select committee last year and what we've seen emerge in Victoria, for instance, that that engagement um, it's not actually just a question of what's contained in the practice note, it's a question of process, yeah. I would say is um, incredibly important as well. Um, Mr. Khan, I think you had a question. The What's technology right beats me every time. Um, this is directed at John Barner, and I think it probably to, to Craig, because I suspect this is probably his area, but no doubt I'll be shown to have been completely wrong in that regard. Um, page 19 of the submission, and more particularly recommendation four. Now, this question relates to, well, I'll, I'll put it, why do you propose that that's the section for amendment? Um, I suppose if you saw some of the earlier, my interest is in uh, what I think is, and I'll have to just go here, I think it's section 50, uh, section 58 and section 61. Um, and that's the sections dealing with essentially self-incrimination. It, it seems to me in the deaths in custody space, the ability to actually have the story told or some part of the story is, is often frustrated by the self-incrimination provisions. And I'm wondering if you've given that consideration uh, as to whether it's appropriate for those sections to be the subject of reform. We have. Um... I, I think that there is a need for reform for those sections. They, and, and I think it speaks to this, this broader question of purpose. What is the intention? And, and one can understand those, those sections, but, but I think their insertion in the Coroner's Act is almost a throwaway attempt to protect against possible consequences in criminal proceedings. But the point that was made earlier, and I apologise, I think it was one of the speakers from the Australian Lawyers Alliance that made this point, that there's no ability to to consider those certificates prior to hearing is deeply problematic because by the time the witness gets a certificate and is willing to give their evidence, very often their evidence is unreliable due to time. Um, it, it also, I think, it doesn't necessarily work as intended in any event in some cases. So, for instance, um, 
some individuals like police officers are often required to give him interviews anyway as a result of departmental orders. Um, so I do think there's a need for reform, but I, I also think there can be a danger in reforming that provision without again considering the centrality of the family. So for instance, I would I would advocate for a coroner who's considering giving that protection and trading that immunity for information to speak to a family about it beforehand, identify from the family what their intentions are. Some families we speak to are very stringently about accountability. Some families are very stringently about finding out what happened. My suspicion is that with some deaths, if the coroner was engaging with the family um, earlier and had the capacity um, to make decisions about investigations and whether inquests should flow, my suspicion is some families would say, well, this is what we're particularly concerned about and you've answered that. So um, we may or we may not want an inquest and we may or we may not want the inquest to consider this. So I think that the danger of that provision is it, it comes up sort of while you're on your feet under fire in a court and we can't help but treat it like we're in a trial when those provisions come up. That's, that's what we're trained for. Um, and you can feel the energy in a courtroom when you, you're starting to stray into areas of evidence that the family's particularly interested in. And all of a sudden there's a sudden interjection and there might be an hour long debate um, about whether the certificate should be given. So um, yes, that's a very long winded way of saying yes, I apologize. No, that's all right. That's all right. Mr. Khan, do you have further questions? No, no, I think that covers my area of concern. Okay, Ms. Sharp or Mr. Roberts, do you have questions? Mr. Shoebridge, do you have additional questions? I've got some questions as well, but so I might start while you're getting yourself off mute. Um, this is question is directed to Jambana. Um, at page 19, recommendation two, you recommend the return of directly initiated coronial prosecutions in First Nations deaths in custody matters. I think that's referable to paragraphs 11 and 12 of your submission. Have I understood correctly that you want the coroners to be able, as it were, to commit people for trial? Or are we simply talking about the issue of referral of a matter to the DPP here? So um, I should say this is partially a product of the short turnaround time for of course. the submissions. And if possible, I'd, pref I'd like to take that on notice. Happy um, for you to do so and give yeah. a longer response. That's fine. Yeah. Um, all Thank right. You. I might just say, I apologise, uh, Mr. Searle. I'll, I'll just say this. The reason I'd like to take it on notice is because of some of the um, submissions and evidence that's flowed previously today and from other submissions. It seems that everybody is attempting to find a way to fix this issue. And yep. some suggestions are hybrid models, some suggestions are specialist court. This was one suggestion that we made. But mm. um, I think. Um, my pref well, I say my preference. No, no, you, you can take it on notice. You, you've got a right to take a matter on notice, and you don't need to explain. It's that's perfectly uh, fine. Um, my final question to Jambana is in relation to your recommendation three. So, do I understand your evidence is that when the issue of a referral to the prosecuting authorities uh, is is uh, being considered by the coroner? that families don't have standing at the moment to make submissions to the coroner on that matter? And is that what you're suggesting needs to be remedied here? Or is it, is it, have I, is it a different perspective that you want the families to be able to require a, a matter to be referred to the prosecuting authorities? Just wanted to get a better understanding of, of what it is you're suggesting here. Um. Yeah, so the interpretation given to those provisions by Coroner Lee in the David Dungay matter was that the family has no right to be heard. And the reasoning process was that no parties have a right to be heard in an inquest except for the coroner. Mm -hmm. um, families are regularly conferred a right to appear and be heard. But um, Coroner Lee um, characterised that right by reference to um, the traditional idea of a party having a, a right to be heard because there may be some um, negative comment made about their behaviour or some suggestion of accountability. Therefore, Coroner Lee's view was 
because there's no possibility that a family's right to be heard in that way could be damaged by a failure to refer, um, there is no right to be heard on a referral. Now, in that matter, I, in fairness, Coroner Lee received submissions from the family um, and then uh, in his findings held that he wasn't going to consider submissions and he didn't need to hear from counsel assisting. And so you can imagine how that felt to the family being told you don't actually don't, you don't have a right to be heard on the question of whether there should be a referral. Okay. I think I understand your concern. I'll ask right a follow-up question. Of course. Craig, do, do I understand that to be in a sense, the coroner observing that under the coroner's act, no party has a right of appearance. That is, in the inquisitorial model, everything is done by leave. That's right. That's that's exactly right. And, and the coroner's view was that in those circumstances, really understanding that provision is about understanding and the referral provision is really about understanding that it's a handbrake effectively. So that when the coroner forms a view that there may be a criminal and a serious indictable criminal offence that is that has occurred on the evidence on the admissible evidence or one is charged that's designed as a handbrake to stop anything happening to protect the interests of the accused it's not designed as a um, lens through which to consider accountability but often families when they come to coronial inquests are looking for accountability and they've and they understand that the coroner has the power to refer so um, and I should say it does raise another issue about the Coroner's Act, which is that, and the previous coroner spoke about this today, the discretion is extremely broad, there's very little supervision of it in the Supreme Court. So the decision of Coroner Lee, um, potentially it would be judicially reviewable in the Supreme Court, but... If you have the resources to go there. If you have the resources, and most practitioners are going to say, to what end? Mm. Um, thank you. Um, in relation to um, uh, Dr. Scott Bray, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, I think to your submission to the First Nations Deaths in Custody uh, inquiry, you did touch on the coronial jurisdiction. And as one of your concerns, you did raise the lack of accountability around coroner's recommendations. Uh, about whether they were binding or not binding, and uh, you discussed, I believe, I can recollect, the obligation on at least state actors to meaningfully uh, respond to coroner's recommendations. Uh, and I think your view was that, that those provisions certainly needed to be strengthened. Um, are you able to to speak to to those matters in a bit more detail here? And in doing so, should coroners be able to require responses of state agencies and non-state actors as well who might be the subject of their recommendations? Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think they should. Um, I mean, it's important to note that in all jurisdictions where recommendations are issued, so for example, in Victoria where there are mandatory, there's a mandatory a statutory response regime, um, you know, recommendations are still not binding in that sense, you know, and this, so it's it's really sort of where does the issue begin and where where does it end? So in my opening comments, I, I sort of made a statement about the significance of recommendations and the attention to the issues, which seem to get stuck on the issue of whether they should be whether there should be a mandatory response regime, whether it should be sort of enshrined statutorily, and these sorts of issues um, compared to the the what I, what I would call frankly met the mess that currently exists in New South Wales in relation to um, the you know the policy memorandum issued in 2009 right through to the the recording and the storage online of responses to recommendations which is it's, it's just a swamp of of information which is very it's you know it's not even located you have to do a Google search. It's on the Department of Justice website. It's on this sort of completely clunky sort of word document you open up. You have to kind of trawl through, and and then it's then it's got a, a sort of a separate section where you can look at specific recommendations categorised under you know particular uh, 
um, you know, deaths related to mental ill health or um, deaths in custody, for instance, which still is inadequate to the task, you know. Um, and I, so I think we, when we talk about the coronial jurisdiction, this includes internationally as well, we, we get hung up on these, you know, quite obvious points. But really, it's some, there's, a, there's a lot of much more subtle, nuanced and complex work that has to go on around recommendations beyond the issue of whether there is a mandatory response regime or not. And I think this has been highlighted by the experience of Victoria, which has had a mandatory response regime for a number of years now, essentially since the, the BPLRC review of 2006 and then the new Act in 2008, where, you know, we have a very sort of slick um, online posting of findings and uh, responses to them, which was a, a which is a requirement so that they can be kind of accessed, remembering that it's not only um, it's not only advocates who seek to interrogate databases with of which contain coronal information, it's researchers, it's journalists, but it's also really importantly families who engage with the coronial system who look for um, and I, I, I don't mean to use the term lightly, but like cases, you know, trying to find, and I've spoken to many families in Victoria, I'm currently um, doing a project with some colleagues who have used that facility to try and um, gain traction in understanding the coronial appreciation of the circumstances of death, which might be similar to um, to, to their loved one. So, so we've got, a, a, you know, over a decade of experience with a mandatory response regime, but the very limited research that has been done into that regime is that there are all sorts of issues that, that undergird it, you know, the formulation of recommendations, the issue of supplanted recommendations where you have, you know, so Sutherland et al did a, a study into supplanted recommendations where essentially you have such a long period of delay between the, the death and the inquest and coronial findings and recommendations that you have organisations who have subsequent, subsequently sort of tidied up and fixed some issues, not necessarily all. So there's those issues. There's also the formulation of appropriate recommendations, but then there's the nature of the responses to them. So yes, I think that we um, should have a, a mandatory response regime. I think it's the right thing to do in a system which, which hinges on the espousal of death prevention and its modern heart. I think that's very important. Um, but I also think that the Victorian experience illustrates that there's a whole range of other issues that we really need to wrestle with when we are looking at this, this issue of coronial recommendations and the, the effect that they have. It also relates to how many inquests we hold, the discretion of coroners to hold inquests, the capacity of coroners to make preventative forward-looking discretionary decision making around the kinds of inquests and the scope of inquests. Um, uh, you know, ex-state coroner um, Jerem this morning raised what I consider to be a very important issue in relation to issues around climate change as heat mortality. It's a whole range of issues um, specific to the modern society in which we live in, um, which coroners can have quite productive interventions in. Uh, you know, um, under under the label of, of death prevention. So there's a lot of work to be done. That's not just legislative, but it's, it's, it's a question of policy, but it's also a question of practice and it is threaded right through the system. Okay. Um, one of the, I guess, innovations in the Victorian system is the Victorian Coroner's Prevention Unit, which seems to have as its charter the analysis uh, and uh, interrogation of data produced through coronial inquiries and to sort of assist coroners to provide, if you like, an evidence base so that they can make improved recommendations. Is that an innovation? And this is a question to all of you. Is that an innovation New South Wales should also embrace? Okay. Uh, Dr Scott Ray? Uh, th thank you. I think so. I think there are uh, a number of um, you know, issues with research informing uh, coronial processes mm -hmm. um, and the, the sort of the nature of the kind of research which is privileged. I think, I mean, and that wasn't a 
a sort of a legislative initiative. That was a policy initiative. And initially it was it was a trial initiative, essentially, mm. by um, the Victorian government, which has, has seen since been sort of solidified and consolidated. Um, I think, and it's not just, uh, it doesn't just inform recommendation practice, it, it informs inquest. So it, mm. so in the case of um, Becky Aris, they're uh, an important case around excited delirium. And here we had the CPU engaging in research, which um, sought to you know, enliven the coroner about particular research and debates around the, the issue of excited delirium as a, as a potential diagnosed cause of death. And then what we see through that is the the kind of importation of that to the New South Wales coronial jurisdiction in um, some matters recently held here into the deaths of people, including First Nations people, where the coroner made an explicit, the state coroner um, made an explicit statement in her findings about the value of the CPU informing, you know, not only this question of recommendations, which people talk about the CPU in relation to you know, quite often, but really around these other issues that inform inquests, whether it's scope or whether it's forensic medical issues um, and important matters like that. So, you know, the value of, you know, having one, having a research unit concentrated in one jurisdiction where we have a kind of a federated, you know, country, a federated system of um, coronial practice is really important because, of course, the, the, you know, the NCI, the National Coronary information system was set up as a sort of a federated initiative to kind of bring uniform perspective to something that had been missing um, hitherto from the coronial um, system. And arguably the CPU is um, kind of infusing its expertise through other jurisdictions. So of course you have then um, a question of coroners being able to draw on the insights from the Victorian-based system, but related to issues which are actually being raised across the country and really important issues. Um, so, but one of the issues that I would have with that, so it's not just about recommendations, it's also about informing the, the scope and the perspective of um, coroners, you know, within investigation and inquest. But one of the issues um, is in relation to the emphasis on, on the kind of research. now. People might say, well, you'll say that because you're a social scientist. So, you know, yeah, of course, of course you sort of value the, the, the practice of, of social science research. But I do think that, you know, an emphasis on public health, an emphasis on uh, trends and patterns, and, and Alison's work speaks really importantly to this as well. Um, you know, it, you can't just res restrict coronial scope to those sorts of issues. There are social justice issues involved in the investigation of deaths that really come to the fore, obviously, in, in very specific deaths. And there is a wealth of expertise amongst, um, you know, advocates, community-based organisations, disability advocates, um, you know, First Nations communities that have expertise and resources that can inform questions of research in the coronal jurisdiction. And I think we, we do a great disservice to the issues that coroners are tasked with investigating and deaths that coroners are tasked with investigating by you know closing off the scope of what we would consider to be productive research capacities. So I believe that it's important to expand what we would consider kind of um, verifiable or useful research in the context of coronial death investigation. Okay. Uh, does Jambana have a, a response to my query? And then I think we might go to uh, Mr. Shoebridge. Okay, Mr. Shoebridge. Can I just ask um, some very practical details about the engagement of First Nations families with the coronial system? Probably to you first, Ms. Whitaker, and then to you, Professor Williams. Um, if you live in Moray and you have a modest income and you need to get eight family members down to Lidcombe to spend a week to hear a coronial inquiry, what support is there? There's virtually none except that um, which the families manage to organise themselves. Often what happens is that the community controlled sector or the community itself organises to fundraise to cover as many of these expenses as they can. But this is often done at the last minute when it becomes apparent, usually through the family's council, that it's necessary. A lot of these inquests um, 
for the more complex and serious matters, especially for First Nations deaths in custody. Go for up to two weeks. It's a period that's extraordinarily difficult to get a large group um, of people who might comprise that about that person's kin and loved ones. Very difficult to find them that kind of accommodation at last uh, at late notice. Extraordinarily expensive and very difficult to organise that transport. So there's nothing systematic um, about that support, and it relies a lot on community goodwill that's already so so stretched. Professor Williams, I concur with Alison, and also we must note that this comes at a cost. And those costs aren't borne um, or considered. That's financial costs if people take time off work, childcare, costs to health and well-being, as well as um, to um, the participation in other elements of community life that others then have to take on or that there are gaps when that occurs. So we need to not only pay but to cover those broader costs and urgently think through practical strategies to do that. And the additional stress that that places on families who are already grieving, stressed about the coronial system, to not even know if they've got somewhere to stay, uh, it's, it seems to be a, a, a mark of disrespect um, to the families from the system. That's like they're, they're an add-on. How, how is it felt by families? That's right. If I, I could read um, some words of a Wiradjuri elder who's been through the coronial process. Um, and she, she, it has stayed with her for several years. What they did to the body, the atrocities that occurred to the body, the pictures, the language used, and the medicalizing of social issues the need for debriefing about these atrocities has persisted for years. And these, there are costs across generations for the children of the elders and also the sheer interruption to the passing on of critical cultural knowledges that can't occur when families are experiencing atrocities perpetuated by the state's processes. Thanks, Professor. Could I just ask you, is there a, a fundamental problem with the current structure for First Nations families, particularly for deaths in custody? They've, they've seen a family member caught up in the criminal justice system, taken into a state institution, die in the state institution, and then their, their access for justice is to go right back into the court system um, with a bunch of lawyers around them. Is that a kind of irremedial problem? How do, we, how do we address that? I might go to you, Professor Williams. I think that is an example of multiple and compounding trauma to not only have traumas from incarceration and the drivers of incarceration that are often outside an individual's control um, to not be addressed, but then also these um, really experiences um, as you've outlined I think too, from a public health um, perspective, we do use a socio-ecological model and or a holistic model of care. And I think about why, say in palliative care, for example, when people are expected to die in prison, and if they've not been released from prison to die in the community or die on country, which is our cultural protocol and responsibility, I need to add that, um, our model of care, say it's case management, it, in, according to Indigenous knowledges, it should be continuous case management from within prison throughout the period of the person passing on and then throughout the coronial process that includes support for the family. There's no reason why systems like that can't be designed so that then there can be referral and funding of therapeutic care that does address the deeper distress that people have when they see atrocities that aren't spoke of, as well as the sheer burden of carrying these issues over such a long period of time, often to then um, experience 
an injustice at the end of it that lingers then for decades or across generations. That's the reality of our families. And that is destructive in the face of us actually having solutions that we think the state could use in making a better way forward. Ms. Whitaker? On your observation, um, Mr. Shoebridge, I recall um, experiencing with families who are trying to develop a uh, family that this um, kind of protocol, it's reasonably informal, that tends to happen at First Nations deaths in custody inquests where the final say effectively will be given to the family about who the, the deceased person was, what they meant to them and what they were looking for out of the inquest. Um, and that's a tremendous moment for families to have, but it often, um, it, in a sense, procedurally is isolates them to having this memorial role rather than the substantial role that they often want to play uh, in the fact-finding mission of the coroner. Uh, in the course of developing that, families often find it um, difficult to have the resources and the space to do that. And I bring it up because you note the, um, I suppose the pathway of trauma from criminalization and incarceration into this um, quite reasonably strict judicial setting um, with all, it, despite, it, it, despite its informalities, has a lot of protocols that mimic policing, like the really heavy security on days where there's gonna be lots of attendance or especially sensitive inquests, to also the policing that families experience when they're doing something as simple as uh, taking a photo of their loved ones when they're in a family conference room, which uh, while prohibited under the Court Security Act from memory, is actually not affecting the sensitive um, protocols of the court. And their experience of policing in that moment can be quite traumatic because they're, they're participating in a, an active memorialization, an active gathering their families, um, that's then brought home again to this idea of penalty. Um, I also want to bring up something that um, Craig and I saw in Professor Williams' submission that we'd really love to make sure that it's brought to this committee's attention, which is the idea of a complaints mechanism um, that families can access in relation to um, the, the matters kind of surrounding the proceedings. Um, we've observed Craig and I in our time uh, supporting families through these proceedings in various capacities, um, gross what I can only describe as grossly insensitive, um, bordering on cruel uh, misconduct um, done by um, anybody who's sitting at the bar table. Um, often, as I think was mentioned in an earlier submission, uh, in the corridors and the cafes of the court. Um, one especially egregious example of this um, is a, a party um, and their advocate were, were gathered after just having given evidence about a restraint technique, were gathered in the cafe engaging in horseplay, um, mimicking that restraint technique um, and saying very, very insensitive things about the deceased person, uh, which was then overheard by the family. And they had, in effect, no formal mechanism by which they could um, access, redress um, for the wounds that had caused them, for the sense of indignity and contempt they felt that they were being treated by the court within that time, even though it wasn't coming from the coroner's court itself. And it's also common to see um, these practices, especially as um, people at the, the bar table before the court's formally sitting, engaging in the discussion of the routine of the day, how much they're charging, et cetera, et cetera, in, in a way that families find incredibly degrading um, in their experience as well. Uh, and so a formal complaints mechanism um, not only to address these insensitivities, um, but also some of the, the more egregious violations that families experience during the course of the inquest um, would be incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, and though it wouldn't go any way in redressing the full sweep um, of violences that First Nations people experience in the coroner's court, uh, it would be one small step forward to at least having them ventilated. Um, Dr. Scott Bray, I think you want to respond, but I just will draw everyone's attention to the fact that formally time for this session has expired. So we'll take Dr. Um, Scott Bray's response and we'll conclude the proceedings at that point. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I'll be, I'll be really brief. I just wanted to really echo and support that um, recommendation. I think it's really important and I think, you know, jurisdictions the world over are wrestling with how they place the, the, those who, who are most affected by the 
the death of someone at the centre or um, to be given appropriate status within coronal investigation process, practice um, and procedure. You know, whether we legislatively, legislatively enshrine this and recognise it in the objectives or principles to enact or, um, you know, whether we engage in um, uh, guidance, practice notes, things like this. You know, but if we take a sort of a parallel example of victims in the criminal justice system, you know, we have a charter of victims' rights, we have a complaint process that's available um, to victims. Now, that the, the, the status of victims can be a very problematic one, but I think that, you know, if we are wrestling so much with, you know, how we actually appropriately acknowledge and recognise families in the process, I think a charter for the bereaved, um, as uh, Professor Phil Scraton and, and I suggested that to the select committee, last year would be a sort of a good place to start in terms of formalising it. <clears throat> and I think this also goes to the issue that Alison also raised about questions of memorialisation and the status that families have. So the role of the role of statements, you know, so statements are something that have sort of slowly developed and evolved. Um, and families typically give family and community statements at, at the close of the inquest, you know, and it, and it is it is such a a tumultuous time for, for families, the, the sort of the close of the inquest. And, you know, I sort of wonder that, you know, and I am not a person to presuppose that any model is the right model because, you know, it, you have to talk to the families about it and communities. But, you know, do we need to have a sort of a formalisation of recognition of the role of family statements and the, the purposes for which they are given, um, when they are in terms of proceedings, whether it is, for example, empowering and um, a suitable form of recognition to have it at the beginning of proceedings, which it, it sometimes is, um, and, it, and it is in, more frequently in terms of the um, English, uh, England and Wales jurisdiction. I mean, I'll, I'll say, I'll, obviously, I don't want to go on to chew up time, but I think it's very important when we're talking about questions of you know rights and roles that we 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 start to think about how we can sort of really structure these things into the jurisdiction so they're not just sort of informal ad hoc processes right well i'd like to thank uh everybody all the witnesses for attending this hearing uh, your evidence has been very uh insightful and i'm sure will be very useful in our deliberations uh for those who have taken questions on notice the secretariat will contact you in, relations, in relation to those questions. Um, and committee members may have supplementary questions that they'll put uh, on notice to you. And the secretary will also uh, be in touch about those matters. This concludes the first public hearing of the inquiry. And uh, I'd just like to conclude by uh, thanking you all for coming along and sharing with us your insights.